three. Welcome to another episode of Pizza Punk. I'm Screaming Jay Pizza tonight, and I'm sitting here with Mike Hideous. We both have our hats on. <laughs> they look really great. Yours Mike looks looked much great. better. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, this is my wife's hat. I stole it from her. Oh, she probably looks I good thought, in it. <laughs> I, I, I figured, I was like, you know, that kind of looks like uh, uh, one of Mike's hats. I want to take this thing. It looks great. I love it. I'm into it, you know. Uh, welcome, dude. Welcome to my show. How you doing? I'm all right. Good to good to see you and talk to you again, Jeff, as always. Yeah, we just, I mean, I, I wish this was more of like a blind hello, but Mike and I have been in very recent communication, but we've specifically not talked about things so that we could have some organic conversation. And I'm gonna I'm gonna launch, I'm gonna warm Mike up. Uh, right out the gate with the question that I ask everybody, Mike, this is the thesis question of the show. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you the question and then I'm just going to keep talking like the loud mouth that I am going to give you a moment to think about it. And then you tell me the answer. And it's a very subjective answer. There's no wrong answer, Mike. It's whatever you think. That's what I love about this question. Okay. That's the whole, whole point behind pizza punk. And it is this Mike is pizza punk and if it's punk why is it punk and if it's not punk why is it not punk well you see <laughs> first of all yes pizza am i am i coming in all right can you hear me okay yeah yeah you're good you're good okay. dude mm -hmm. so yes pizza is definitely punk it's about as punk as ramen noodles ah and uh, uh probably uh gatorade so yes uh it's cheap it's uh, it's the kind of it's the kind of food that uh, uh, punks and squatters buy when when, when uh, they don't when they're out on the street asking people for a dollar so that they can buy some food. So yes, it's very it's very punk rock. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I I make pizza on my own. I, I make my own pizza. I don't even I don't even order it. I make my own pizza. T tell me tell me a couple. Just give me a few. Just a few like like of the Mike hideous secrets to making your own pizza like what kind of surface do you cook the pizza on are you just like is it straight in a pan do you have a special stone and anything you can divulge for us the the, the, the minds we're all waiting Mike for these answers it's, it's very simple it's very simple and in my opinion it's better than store-bought pizza depending on where you buy it obviously but I go out to to the supermarket I get these uh pre-made um uh crusts by by an italian company called boboli and uh, okay just take regular tomato sauce i happen to like prego i take prego tomato sauce put it on there uh mozzarella cheese i i take sausage i i, I cut <laughs> i cut up sausage i i fry the sausage in in olive oil with a little bit of garlic and uh after i cook the pizza then i put the 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 um the cooked sausage on it rather than some people cook the sausage right on the pizza. I cook it first and then I put the, the, the sausage and the olive oil on the, the pie itself. And I'll tell you, I, I, I hate to brag, but it's friggin' good. <laughs> it, you know, it sounds really good. And you know, when you were talking about garlic just now, or you, I think you just mentioned garlic. I immediately think whenever I hear garlic, I immediately think of Paul Servino in Goodfellas when they're in the jail and he takes the razor blade and he cuts it. Yeah, he cuts the 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 cloves of garlic so that they vaporize. You know in how the long pan. that would you know how long that would take with the amount of garlic that I use because I love garlic. <laughs> me too, I man. Use, I use garlic on everything. It's the Italian in me, and uh, it would take me at least two hours. I mean, it takes me almost thirty minutes just to cut up the, the the garlic into just little chunks. You know, right? Uh, I also make a lot of stir fry too, so. Um, I'm always cutting up garlic and onions and I just love garlic and onions and they're really good for you too. Aside from making enemies when you talk to someone, uh, right. it's, it's a really good anti, uh, antioxidant or an antioxidant. Antioxidant, um, I think. So yeah. And I also take, uh, I also take vitamins, uh, 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 garlic vitamins too. It's really good for you. So, immunity. Good for the immunity system, yeah, right? Um good. You know, I've tried to vaporize the garlic in the pan, just like it's, that movie. I literally used a, 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 it's a, it doesn't work. It's bullshit. It's a lie. It's a goddamn lie. It's a goddamn lie. 
Paul Servino, Martin Scorsese, you lied to me. They lied to me. What a great movie. It's a great, oh, it's one of those movies I could watch over, like Return of the Living Dead. I could watch Goodfellas over and over again. It's like wherever it is on like TBS, you know, or whatever it's playing, I'll just start it right then and there and I'll just go on and on. Hold on. We got some comments real quick. We have, what's Mike's opinion on pineapple and pizza, Mike? <laughs> I'm sorry, fruit and pizza don't mix. <laughs> Oh, oh. Uh, you know, you maybe maybe you know this. Are, are you, do you live in Lodi? Do you live? I don't know if you want to. No, I don't that. live in Lodi. I spent a lot of time in Lodi with Sal right. B, but I, there, I I'm from White Plains, New York. There, there, there is a uh, there is a section near Clifton, uh, close to Lodi. There's a pizza parlor. Years ago, when I was about 21, I used to I was dating this this girl in Clifton, and on my way there, I used to go past uh, uh, Lodi, and there was a pizza parlor that used to serve like all kinds of crazy um, pizza uh, town. No, 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 I don't think so. It's oh my god, where was it? I I don't even remember the names of the street. We're talking like you know. 30 years ago. Right. <laughs> so no, I don't remember, but uh, they, I remember they used to advertise that they were making pizza with pineapples and, and I'm just not a fruit. <laughs> I'm just not a fruit and uh pizza guy. You know, like, you want to like, know I'm, something? I'm also you not a cake it. and fruit guy. It's got to be either like vanilla cake with chocolate icing or nothing okay. at all. Okay. I can respect that. Listen, I, you know, individual preference. You can't yuck on somebody's yums when it's an individual preference i think personally i think pineapple on pizza does work but you need pepperoni you need it needs to be a dynamic contrast of flavors if it's right. just if it's just pineapple and cheese it's like that is weird but if you have the sweet and the salty for the one two punch it makes a little more sense at least for my palate personally in my personal opinion yeah. um but wait there's something else i wanted to ask you before oh now oh the the questions are flying high high and free it's going to take forever route 46 um let me let me ask you uh this as well um do you think that do you think that there is a specific like can anything be pizza mike to you or do you need do you need like the three classic ingredients in the order of the three classic ingredients or else you're it, 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 I mean, to, for me, I'm really simple. There's not a lot of food that I like, and I'm not very exotic. I, I like to just, if I'm going to make pizza, it's pizza crust with tomato sauce and the, and the basic, you know, mozzarella cheese. If, mozzarella. I'm, if I wanted to get like classy or, 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 um, uh, you know, just be kind of, a chef. That's when I started adding adding sausage, but otherwise, no. I, I'm I'm not. I tried something about two weeks ago. I actually tried it with with um, hamburger meat, but it doesn't have the same. Like sausage has, uh, you can get mild. You can get uh, 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 supersata. Su oh yeah, that's something different. Supersata. <laughs> uh, but um, <laughs> with sausage, you get either sweet, mild, or hot. So I usually get the the mild. And it's got um, it's got these seeds in it, and I can't remember what they're called, but the seeds add the flavor to the pizza. So, right, like I said, I'm I'm pretty simple. I don't I don't I'm not extravagant with, with cooking. Very. You simple. know what they say, Mike? You know what they say? There is brilliance in simplicity, in all things. There's brilliance in simplicity. So that that's cool, man. Um, Eric is asking. This is this segues perfect into our next topic. Eric is asking, does Mike have, this was the guy, hey, remember when we were testing things and someone was like, I'm <laughs> I'm early for once. That was this guy. <laughs> oh, Would you, okay. Eric, what you don't realize is that when you messaged us yesterday, we were just testing everything out to make sure we were good to go for today. We were doing sound check, but and what was funny was, work. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, it was everything, you know, everything works out. It yeah, works well, out the way it's supposed to. Um, I'm but it was just funny funny. when it comes to the computer, that's all. So Jeff, you, you Jeff know, had to, Jeff had to help me figure out how to do this. Cause I am an idiot when it comes to the internet. I'm just so unsavvy. You know what you did? You, you, you made a good effort, but this, but this brings <laughs> us to, this brings us to our first like topic for the evening. What I wanted to ask you about, because I've, I've been seeing some rumblings on, Instagram, you sort of popped out, uh, popped back out from the ether just to like 
you know, be like, hey, they got a new a new project, and I'm actually gonna I actually have something. I'll pull it up right here, but I'll let you just talk about it. Tell me about this new project. What's going on? Okay, so the name of the project is called Momento Morte, which is a combination of Latin, old Latin, and Italian. And uh, it means, essentially, it means, uh, remember, you must die. Thank you. That's that's the uh, website. Wow. And it's um, basically, uh, guitarist Anthony Marr had contacted me over a year ago. Uh, in February. Initially, he asked me if he could bring Empire Hideous down to South America for a tour. And, you know, I kicked the idea around for a week. I talked to the guys in the band and everything from, from Empire Hideous. And um, they were like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And then all of a sudden that this goddamn China virus like hit and destroyed the whole effing world. So we had to cancel that. Okay, so from that point, Anthony and I began to keep communicating with each other, trying to work out another deal. I think it was about summertime, perhaps June or July, when uh, Tony asked me if I wanted to do a side project. And I kicked the idea around. We talked about it for about a month. <clears throat> and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. You know, I'll try it out. So um, we... Uh, he sent me some music. I laid down some lyrics to it. Uh, in fact, I'm continually, uh, I, I've been working on some lyrics for a couple different songs. And um, the first single, if you will, is coming out, uh, I think, if all goes well, I believe it's going to be released on April 2nd. And uh, the, first, uh, the first song that we're supposedly going to release is called Between Us. Uh, I wrote the lyrics and Anthony wrote the music. And... Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, we don't. Uh, I, oh, by the way, I should probably mention the other uh, uh, musicians. Uh, Tom Noor on bass, who is a phenomenal bass player and a great songwriter with a great band. Um, and uh, his drummer and our uh, current drummer, uh, 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 Danny Sticks. And uh, they're from they're from uh, the western side of Florida almost by Texas. And Tony is down in Panama as of currently. Wow. And so, yeah, this is spread out. This is a really weird project for me because I've never done anything like this. And, cool. Um, so it, it's a really, it, 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 it's, it's different. Yes. And it's also a little complicated because I'm not used to writing music or even recording music in this dimension. This is completely new for me. So, um, we're, we're trying our best. We're going to, you know, we're going to release a couple of demos and then if all goes well, if, um, if things go well and we either get a, uh, you know, a record label that is interested in us and, or do a tour, which would either be in South America, uh, and, or Europe, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go with it. I'll, I'll give it a shot, but I'll tell you, I gotta be honest with you. This is the last project I'm ever doing. Really? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I, I, you know, I, I retired from music in 2008. I was done. I was done. Right. I spent. I spent you mentioned 20 that. Yep. years. I spent 20 years doing Empire Hideous, and right. I, I never really got to that plateau with the band mm -hmm. that I wanted to, and uh, and it was just a constant revolving door of musicians coming in and out. Mostly, it was bass players. But uh, there was, oh, or even a second guitarist, and it was always an issue. So you know, because then you got to teach them, you got to teach right. them how to play, and, and it takes months. It doesn't. It's you know, yeah. For us, we used chemistry. To rehearse, we used to rehearse three days a week for about three hours a night, and if I wasn't rehearsing, I was at the studio writing music, jamming music. I, I we had another band that used to 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 used to share the studio with us. I used to jam with the the guitar player who used to also fill in on on guitar for Empire Hideous. So this just went on for for a very long time. You know, we, I was trying to keep it tight. But when you lose a bass player or a, a rhythm guitarist, and you get somebody new, you got to go through this whole training period where they learn every accent of yep. the instrument that they're playing, of the song yep. that they're playing on their instrument. Yep. And I, I I just couldn't keep it together. You know, if you can't keep to keep a band together for three years, you might as well quit because it's just it's pointless. It really is because. You know, you just got to keep teaching people over and over and over. And then they come in and then they go out and then you got to start all over again. 
It's ridiculous. Let, let me interject here for one second. I, I'm curious to know. Talk talk to me a little bit, or if you could explain for say uh, those who are not musicians, the, the the chemistry in a band, and the dynamics of a band, and if you change a member, how does that change dynamics? and chemistry and what does that do to everything if you could talk a little bit about that sure well i i can give you some prime examples when i when i first started the band and we were nobody uh it took about let's see um it took about uh, us till about night from 1988 to 1994 95 in 94, 95, the band began to really climb the ladder. And like we were getting a lot of shows in New York. A lot of people started to like really dig the band. We we're opening with other bands or and playing bigger shows. Um, and that's when we, we really started to get more notoriety. But before that, from the early days on, like I'll never forget the first lineup I had. My whole, my whole idea was to create a band record an album and continue to play. And right. it, it, and it began to snowball for me and I really got into it. Um, and then there was a certain point, in fact, that in, in 19, I believe it was 1989, 88, when I had, uh, when was it 89 and 80? I can't even remember, but 88, 89, I had some serious uh, health issues and I, I, right. I decided that, I was going to put all my focus into being a musician because I, I, as an artist, I wanted a new outlet. So rather than using the paintbrush or the pencil, I wanted the microphone and the amplifier to, you know, push out my ideas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I really, I really went, you know, completely, uh, you know, head first into it. And at the time, every once in a while, I would get, I'd have to get new musicians. Well, actually, let me let me go back. I had the first lineup. Go ahead. So, yeah. so we were together for just about, I guess, just about two years until 1990. Hmm. And then they got upset and quit because I was taking things into my own hands because nobody else was. I was the one down at the club handing out flyers. I was the right. one making the flyers, booking the shows, writing the songs. Um uh, you know, planning rehearsals, uh, making stickers, t-shirt. I was doing it all and they, they did nothing. Let me ask and you a question. Super quick interjecting pause, pause button for one second. What the, just so I fully understand when you started the empire hideous, you know how like it's the same thing you see with like Marilyn Manson and Alice Cooper and stuff like was the empire hideous initially a band or was it your, project and you brought in the musicians and again forgive me i'm not a musician i don't understand how these again uh, every situation is different if you could just elaborate a little bit on that so uh, i um oh boy this goes way back into like 1980 87 so okay I okay was i was 21 years old and i wanted to i wanted to do music and as right. I mentioned, I had, I had these health problems and I was in and out of the hospital and I really, I found, um, if you will, I found a, a desire to want to make music. So it was just me. And I was writing on this simple Casio keyboard back then. And I would basically record ideas onto a boom box. And back then you could actually hit record yeah. on a tape player back then and cool. record stuff. Now you can't mm -hmm. do that. So, um, I used to, you know, put these ideas down. And then a friend of mine who I was friends with at the time, Don, uh, Don Ferratu, who was the guitar player. Don Ferratu. Right. <laughs> and uh, his real name is Don Gulbovic. And uh, he oh. actually went on, yeah, he went on to do another band you might even know about, the Tombstones uh, Rockabilly Band. Uh, that sounds familiar. Okay. Anywho, the point yeah. is, uh, at the time, Don was like 16 years old, still in high school. Wow. One day I went over him, like him and his cousin, we used to hang out, me and his cousin, Rob. So uh, I went over the house, Don was there, Rob was there, we're all smoking pot, you know, we're having a good time. And um, I really want, like he was playing his guitar and I was like, damn, for a 16 year old kid, you're pretty good. 
And I asked him, I said, listen, I got about 12 songs I want to write and I want to record at least six of them. I said, would you be interested in playing in a band with me? And he said, yes. So from that point, him and I worked together. It must have been at least close to a year. And at the time, I was I had just met Jerry Only and Doyle from the Misfits. So not only was that a big deal for me, but all my friends around me were making a big deal out of me because I was friends with Jerry Only and Doyle. So eventually Don and I find these three other guys who were playing in a band and, and literally doing nothing but covers in their basement. So we approached them and I said, listen, here's the deal. You know, where I wrote music. Do you want to play it? I'm going to book some shows, make a recording. They said yes. And then we worked together for about, I guess, just about two years, maybe even a little bit longer until 19. In fact, our last show was at the pipeline in March, I think it was March 19th, 1990, right after we played our first CBGB's gig, which was a, an audition night. And um, was this the lineup with the Fly album? Is this the Fly right, album? Lineup? That's okay. right. Got it. And so, right after that, <clears throat> right after we played the last show, we had a meeting. And as I told you, all the stuff that I was doing to try to promote this band, mm -hmm. they they come to me and they're like, "Look." Um, You've taken what was fun. Mind you, they're talking to me. And they said, you've taken what was fun and now you've now turned it into a job. I said, wait a minute. Do you guys want to be in a band? Do you want to be musicians? Because I'm doing all the work. All you guys do is show up to play rehearsals and a, and a gig. I'm doing all the work. What's the problem? You, you know, pay the I, boss to be the boss, man. So Exactly. <laughs> And so this, this went on for years, you know, it was, wasn't just them. Cause then they, they quit. I got a couple of new guys that failed in like six months, got a couple of new guys that failed after about a year. Uh, and it was just over and over again. So by the time 1994 came around, we hooked up, I hooked up with uh, a guitar player named Mars, a bass player named Eve, uh, a guitar player named Jeff, who I'm still with today. And uh, a drummer at the time named Joey Quest. And we began to play. We uh, we started getting gigs at, at the um, at the Pyramid in New York City. Oh, I know and that then, place. Great, great club. At the bank. And, and I'll tell you, not to bank. brag or anything, but it really blew up for us. And by 1995, we were playing shows to, like sold out clubs. I, I was I was amazed. I couldn't believe it myself how popular the band was getting. And it was only in New York because we could play New Jersey to like 15 people. And then two nights from now, we'd play in New York to like 800 people. So go figure. Um, That's how it works, know, man. Markets, you know it's, like just you, different you know, markets, you know? Well, you know what they say? A, a prophet is never heard in his own land. True. Very true. Very so, true. So, um, yeah. so, okay. So it really is. I mean, it's one of those situations where the, the, you know, it starts off as like the Empire Hideous, but really it's you as kind of like, I guess maybe like it's a band, but it's also like a solo entity that is you, you surround yourself with musicians. And again, but, but to, to go back to my initial question. So what happens when the, when, when you, when you add and subtract members, what does that do for the dynamic and the chemistry? Does that change the sound, I can think of examples where the sound of the band changes because you're changing members and people play, people put different inflections on things. Like, tell me a little bit about that. What was that like? All right. So by 1991, yeah, uh, we, we were looking. So before we got Jeff, before we got Jeff in the band as a second, as a lead guitarist, um, it was just a, a four piece band, only one guitarist. Okay. And I wanted a second guitarist because when I started the band, that that dynamic of, of having stereo guitar really, it really made a difference for me. And there's so much more you can do. Uh, and plus, it's just a wall of sound, you know, just right. really. You're filling things out live. Yeah. So by, by 1991, uh, maybe even by night. No, actually, by night, it was still 1990. and um, we were looking for a guitar player 
And so we auditioned a couple of different people who came in. And, and so many times the people would come in, a guitar player would come in and I would hand them like a tape of the two records that were out at the time, which was the 12 inch EP uh, self-titled. And then the second EP, which was called this evil on earth. And um, each, each one, the first EP had a, a five songs on it. The second one had three and I would tell the people, you know, learn these songs. And then they'd come to a rehearsal or an audition, and then they would put in, like, leads and stuff like that. And I was like, what are you doing? No, that's not how – I wrote the song. Play it like it was written. Yeah. So many, so many people, a lot of guitar players wanted to change things by putting in their own style. And, and I can appreciate that. Yeah. If you're starting out as a whole – whole new group but if you've already mm -hmm. pre-written and established you should really sorry my cat's making noise behind me that's um, cool you should you should really kind of like go with what's been recorded and i had so many problems it was so difficult for me back then you know you, you know, know what's interesting have, you, you know, know we, didn't, we didn't have the internet we didn't yeah. have instagram twitter or facebook or any of this shit that's out today right we, i i had to look for for musicians by putting out classified ads in a magazine called the Aquarian Weekly or the East Coast. Heard Rock, of it. Yep. Right. Uh, I mean, that that's what I had to do to find. And, and oh, my must, God. I, bands you must be into. Sounds like bands right. you must be into. That <laughs> I can't tell you. I, I would list bands. If you don't know these bands, don't right. call. And I would list like, you know, Christian Death, uh, TSOL. Fields of the Nephilim, the Misfits. Oh, we gotta talk about um, those. All those, about all those bands from my early, like early style, Alien Sex Scene. And I would write, if you don't know these bands, don't call. And then I'd get a call from a guy. Like, are, are you a Christian band? Because I saw. <laughs> I, what? <laughs> so. Oh my God, that is hilarious. Um, real quick. Um. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned Christian Death is one of my favorite bands. I love that first Which album. Version? Uh, Roz, obviously, Roz obviously the Roz Williams. Although I've seen, look, I've seen Valor live. This is okay. So, guys, for those of you who are not aware, the, a, a lot of people who are watching are, are are enamored by the Misfits. Super sidetrack note. I just wanted to touch back on what Mike was saying before. Um, and before I forget, you know, it's funny. That's why. That's exactly why Glenn Danzig was looking for people when he was doing. That's why he got. That's why they ended up with Doyle eventually and stuff. You know. Glenn wanted to mold people. He wanted to get people who were not super like experienced because he wanted them to just do what he wanted them to do in the band. You know what I mean? At least at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's just interesting how you said that. That's the first thing that thought that I thought of in my mind of just like, of like, you know, the, I, I have an interview with a guy who's talking about like, yeah, you know, like if you're a really good, really, really good guitar player, you're going to have an opinion or some sort of authorship in what you are uh, doing. You might try to add your own flavor. And if someone is a mastermind with a vision that might go against said vision, interesting, interesting notion, but um, much like the misfits and we always go back graves or dancing, graves or dancing, blah, 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 blah. It's the same thing with Christian death in a way so what's funny is there are, and there's a bunch of bands like that. You mentioned TSOL. I, Mike, you're familiar with the history of TSOL, right? Uh, vaguely. I didn't know there was a big history, but I, I Oh my do, God. I, I have the first record, so. All right. Yeah. Well, that first record is like phenomenal. TSOL, for those of you who don't know, TSOL is secretly a death rock band, even though they don't know they're a death rock band or want to be a death rock band, but everything that they do is death rock, which makes it even more death rock because they're not trying to be death rock they're like they're like surfer bros from like you know they're surfer guys from uh huntington beach but yet they're doing songs like silent scream and code blue and the triangle you listen to the triangle and you're just like this is straight up death rock and they're like no we're hardcore guys it's like so i think that's so cool um but um but christian death is in the death rock community just the way that the the misfits like started this whole genre thing Christian Death is also cited as this band that kind of started Death Rock. Essentially, I, there some people would contest that. And it was started by a 16-year-old kid named Roz Williams when he met up with the adolescents Rick Agnew 
They put out this album called Only Theater of Pain, immaculate, amazing record that is just phenomenal, like the bomb. And then what happened was, long story short, without going into the whole history, another guy comes in. His name's Valor. They do two more albums as Christian Death. Then Roz leaves, and Valor continues as Christian Death. Without well, a, he, he bought the name from Roz. He bought the name, or Roz gave him the name, or right. he trademarked the name. One of the crazy, definitely st- trademarked it. Definitely. To definitely trademarked it, and he continued on. And you know, again, nothing against Valor's music, and nothing against. I saw them. I saw that. That I Valor. Got, I got news for you. I almost killed the entire band of Christian Death once. Shut up. All right, tell that story right now. In, Go in my Go. van. <laughs> Wait, they were riding. Wait, this was Valor was riding with you or something. Valor, uh, what? Valor, his girlfriend Dimitri, uh, the drummer whose name escapes me, and the guitar player. Mm. They were all uh, in my van. All right, let me let me set the 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 stage for you. Go ahead, go ahead, do it. I was working at a place in uh, Hawthorne, New Jersey, called Pleasurable Piercings. I was the publicist. Ah, and I was asked to do in-store signings by band so the first band that i got an opportunity to check in to have uh, have do an in-store signing was christian death switchblade symphony and a band called big electric cat Hmm. they they were on tour uh oh my god what year was that 1995 maybe possibly 96 so um so this is after this sexy thing. death god has come out which is their that's valor's big release after right. so yeah. but, but at that point they had what all due respect to valor and, and christian that they kind of lost some of the momentum yeah anywho so yeah. they were on tour so they're on tour so they 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 come to they're they're doing a show down which which is known at a club that's known as qxt's now mm-hmm. back then it was known as don coyotes um so I knew the promoter. I asked him, hey, you know, can I get the band up here? He's like, yeah, sure, sure. We worked it out. So I drive down to Newark to get them. Now, my van, which was the band van, had, right. no, had no back seats. It was all open, okay? Yeah. So we're driving. We're about literally like two minutes from the location where I'm about to drop off everybody. So they're all in the back. I got like. I must have like 15 people in my van. Yeah. And in in the passenger side is a girl, this girl, Michelle, who used to be a publicist for me now married to my, my guitar player, Jeff. So she's in the passenger side and I'm driving, here I am driving the van and in front of me, I'm I'm going over a slight hill and there's a light. So as I'm going over the hill, I turn back to say something to the band. And when I turn forward again, I see brake lights. So I hit the brakes and everybody in the van went, Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> they Jesus. all fell forward, and all I hear was, oh, 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 oh. So, yeah, oh, no. I almost I almost killed Christian Death. Right through the windshield. <laughs> Symphony and, and Big Electric Cat. I almost killed all three bands. <laughs> um, yeah, I got a lot it, of flack for that. I told him you guys probably hate me now. I'm really sorry, but better that we didn't crash. You know. You know what? I met when I met Valor one time when I went to see them. I he was super. He was super nice guy. Like can't yeah, say a bad like bad him. word about him. Despite you know Valor kind of takes on like a Jerry only sort of uh, uh, you know energy in certain circles, and Roz Williams is like the originator and blah blah blah. Roz Williams tragically passed away leaving Valor to be the sole because Roz Williams started doing Christian death albums as well under that. That's how you get, um, Oh, what he, he did it for Cleopatra. There was, uh, Valor, uh, Valor's band was the original Christian death. When, when Roz came back, he was doing Christian death. I think as just Christian death. I don't remember exactly. Well, yeah. I was, I right. was actually a, a Valor fan. I, I actually liked Valor's. Stuff. I listen, I atrocities is a good album. I like mm-hmm. atrocities. Um, there's a couple of good albums that he that Valor has done. However, for me, I'll, it'll always be catastrophe ballet. So many, and so many over, people only say that. Pain. So oh, many people are are so oh. dedicated to Roz, and I can appreciate that. I mean, he did start it out, but for me, I, I happen to like the way Valor's voice is better now. And I, I can. Probably- are you a fan of cat- catastrophe ballet at all? 
Yeah, I like them all, but I, I was just and, and and people are gonna hate me for saying this, but I was really never a fan of Roz Williams is the way he sang. Interesting. It was, it, well, it was a little bit too because he's like, whiny, like moany. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh. so when Valor sings, I kind of dig it. He's got a really deep voice. And He's got a deep voice. He projects, you know, and I He's really got like, like a Bauhaus. What's that guy from Bauhaus? Peter more Murphy. like a little bit, a little bit more in that lower yeah, sort of register. Hung he's Hungarian. That's why he gets all that energy. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You mentioned Alien Sex Fiend. I, I, when I toured, I toured in Europe We with this, this band and, and they opened up for Alien Sex Fiend. And I was expecting, I like, I had listened to Alien Sex Fiend. So I'm going, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to be very interesting. And I got to tell you, I was really let down by the performance. I just, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what to expect. It was, it was, uh, this was 2012. And like, he, he was like, uh, what's his face? Uh, was it Nikki, Nikki Fiend? Nick something, Nick, right? Nick Fiend. Nick, Nick Fiend. Fiend. He was like wandering around like a, like a homeless man with dementia, like crawling into garbage cans. It was weird, man. I was just that not, was on was stage, not right? They had yeah, that was on stage. Yes. Let me ask you a yes. question: How many, sure. how many shots of whiskey and how many cigarettes did he smoke on on stage during the nothing? Show? And when really? we were backstage, we were not like allowed near their dressing room or anything. Like they didn't, they were super. Well, no, I mean I don't know. We didn't see. I, I didn't see anything because we were okay. They were yeah. I saw Alien Sex Fiend when they came back to America after ten years. It was nineteen. It had to be nineteen ninety. Two, I think maybe yeah. even nine, 91. I'll never forget it because I was standing next to the, the, the guy from, uh, what the hell was, oh God, warrant or some, some, some heavy okay. metal hair, hair band. And I, okay. I, was like, I was like, your band sucks <laughs> this. All right. So anyway, I'll set yeah. the, let me set the stage for this. So this Go was ahead. at the, <laughs> the limelight. All right. At the limelight and right and in New York city. Oh, RIP. Yep. So, um, they had this wonderful stage set up with the with the spider webs and the garbage cans and a bar and all this yeah, crazy yeah. great atmosphere great yeah. atmosphere yeah and they come out they did like a 3 hour show i mean they've got so many records it's a long, i, it's I a long love show. alien sex and i had like yeah. every single record they ever put out from from the as early as the first record when they did ignore the machine so nick fiend comes out and he's he's I can't tell you, man. He must have had 25 shots wow. on stage. Like he would walk over to the bar and he'd get a shot and drink it down. Then he'd smoke a cigarette and then he'd put it out and he'd smoke another cigarette and he'd the put it Death out. Death Rock Lemmy. <laughs> oh my god. It's like every British band, like Sisters of Mercy, they they all they all smoke. Yeah. Even even uh, from the cult, they smoke cigarettes on stage. No wonder they fuck up their voices, you know? <laughs> um, question. People are asking. Uh, Riley Rooster's review is asked. He says, "Ask Mike why he hates Peter Murphy. Why do you hate Peter Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> Who told why? You that? Who told you that? Riley right. just said it. He just said, "Ask Mike why he hates Peter Murphy." In the uh, in two thousand, when was it? It might have been either two thousand or nineteen ninety nine. When I went to go see Peter Murphy, it was his, I believe, his fourth solo album, which was very world music sounding. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not a fan. Yeah. Then I heard that he had moved to Turkey. And from what I understood, now I could be wrong, but this is what I was told. Yeah. He became a worshiper of the Muslim religion. And I am not a fan of any organized religion. So when I heard that, I was like, you got to be kidding. This is a guy who, you know, in the back, in the dark fields, you know, you know in the flat fields, in the flat fields. And I can get by, you know, all, all this yeah. dark stuff. And, and yeah. now he's a Muslim. I'm like, you know, fuck you. I was like, I can't stand that shit. So I completely lost all respect from in addition when Bauhaus got back together in the early part of 2000 I had an opportunity to go I was working for the Aquarian Weekly at the time so I was a journalist right I had an opportunity to go see the band so I go see Bauhaus and I'm watching the band and Daniel Ash who looked fantastic by the way he had this feather jacket on like it just looked magnificent he was just rocking the f out and Peter Murphy, 
he did nothing. And I was like, this, I hate this guy. I'm so done with him. In addition, in addition, I saw him again. And this time I had uh, VIP passes, backstage passes. And I wanted to ask him a few questions after the show. That son of a bitch. Um, I, I, I'm, I waited over two hours for him to come out from the backstage and he comes out and I'm like, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, can I talk to you real quick? I just have a, a quick couple of questions. I'm reviewing the show. Didn't even, didn't even look at me. Just walked right past me. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done. I don't care about Peter Murphy. He had, um, I don't know if you know, Nimvind great band. I'm a huge fan of this band. Nimvind Nimvind opened for Peter Murphy or almost opened for Peter Murphy. And they got like, I don't know the whole story. I don't want to speak for those guys because I don't know what the whole story was, but they had a terrible experience with Peter Murphy where <clears> they like, they drove a whole bunch of time to, they dro drove a long time to open for him and they got, I think they got kicked out of the club. Again, I'm paraphrasing. Please guys, if anybody knows the real story, tell it. I don't know. I just know that they had a bad experience. Glory is noise. TV says I was in a band with Valor's son, Sev Sevan or seven Sevan. 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 Uh, he, I can't, I can't say her name. I'm just going to butcher it. What's, what's her name? The the girl. Jetan. Jetan. Thank you. You didn't butcher it. He Jetan and Jetan. And Savon. <laughs> okay. Uh, he and Jetan are two of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Great memories of that whole Christian death family. They're still out there, man. They're still Christian death. They're still grinding it out. You know, tell him that it's his, tell him, tell him it's Fred, his guitarist. So R Riley Rooster's review is Fred, your guitarist. That's what. That's who Riley is saying. It's Fred. Brian says, Mike is so passionate when he tells stories. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm Italian. What do you expect? I told yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say, you know, what's interesting though. I've heard this several times. And again, this is an observation that I've noticed from several Italians um, that the, uh, that when the passion flares up, like in, in any which way, not positive or negative, but it's always from the Italianness that the passion comes from. It's a very, it's just something I've noticed over over the the years. When, whenever I uh, ha am in the orbit of someone who is Italian, um, interesting observation. Um, Paul I, Seacrest, I, I gotta, I gotta stop you before you go. Go ahead, that go ahead, please. Yeah. What did you just say about guitar player? Who's guitar player? I'm sorry. Um, Riley. Riley Rooster's review says, tell him it's Fred, his guitarist. I think he's saying that he is a guitarist named Fred. No, he is a guitarist named Fred who happens to be your guitarist at either now or at some point. I don't know. Sounds like there's a lot of members of the Empire Hideous, maybe one or... Somehow, I, I mean, if is it Fred Collado? Because Fred Collado was my my first bass player from the, from the 80s. So I don't I, know. I don't know who it is. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't had a. Fr oh, Fred, 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 Fred Zoller, Fred Zoller, Fred, Fred Zoller is my my guitarist, not my bassist. Okay, I got confused. My fault. <laughs> Sorry, Fred. Sorry. <laughs> um, Paul says no one ever mentions the very first Radio Werewolf. When it comes to death rock, it's classic. Before Nicholas got on his. BS. I mean, the guy's music was in eighties. B Horflix. What? I've never heard of Radio Werewolf. What's Radio Werewolf? You know, Are you I think with this? I've got a sticker on my car. It says Radio Werewolf. Huh? Never. I don't heard know of what it. it is either. <laughs> ah, we're finding out. Um, Austin Smith is asking uh, if Mike ever met Marilyn Manson. Mike, did you ever meet Marilyn Manson? Once. Oh boy. Uh, I. I was he a beautiful person? He well, <laughs> da -da 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 -da. it was before that record came out. It was when uh, I think it's what Family Values is that? The, is that I know nothing. I've uh, never listened to Marilyn Manson. The first, I know nothing the first about record it. that came out was I, I think it was called Family Values, and um, they had done their first tour, <clears throat> uh, headlining, and I went to see them at the Limelight. This was uh, mm, they opened for Danzig, I believe, uh, before 19, they right. This was nineteen ninety four. Okay. And and uh so I went to the show. I was absolutely blown away. They blew me away. I was just in awe. In fact, there's a girl I know who lives in Philadelphia now. In fact, I recently just connected with her through Facebook. That night I met her. She was standing right next to me at the concert and we were both looking at it and then when it was all done I just turned to her and I went, 
wow. <laughs> I was blown away. So after that, uh, being being the, the the journalist that I was, I went I went to the backstage. Uh, you know, back then with the limelight, you could pretty much go anywhere in the club. And I I went up into the, what was called the library at the time. I saw Marilyn, and I walked up to him, and I walked right up to him. I just said, "Man, I, I gotta say, I was blown away." And I shook his hand. I said, "You really, you really got it, man. You're amazing." And he's a he is an amazing performer. Or, you know, it, it, he's gotten a little heavy or a lot heavy since then. Um, and I remember there were people that were saying. Uh, you know, they weren't too keen on Marilyn Manson. Um, people were saying, oh, I want to see Marilyn Manson in 10 years. Well, it's been well over 10 years and he's still going at it. So he's a highly he did intelligent explode. person. He yeah, did explode. He, he, he broke He broke out. Um, <clears throat> Paul Seacrest says Nicholas Shrek, which I guess maybe is Nicholas Shrek, like related to Max Shrek from Nosferatu, married, <laughs> or, or I don't Shrek, know. Or Shrek the... Uh, the uh, the 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 troll or whatever the hell he is on the Shrek, charts. right? Shrek. Nicholas Shrek married Anton LaVey's daughter Zena. Oh, and okay. then yeah, 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 yeah. Oni Oni says Radio Werewolf was an L.A. death rock goth band from Los Angeles. I think one of the members was Anton LaVey's daughter. I gotta check them out. That sounds like right up my alley. L.A. death rock man. I'm all about that stuff. Could we were be, just talking have, here. Could also have been his son. Uh, uh, Maybe. Who whose name escapes me? His 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 son used to date a girl I used to live next door to. Interesting. Uh, yeah, she's dead now, unfortunately. But yeah, I can't remember his son's name though. Um, I, I just want to touch back. We were talking about speaking of L.A. Death Rock. I want to touch back on T.S.O.L. because I want to tell you how crazy this is. <clears throat> we talked about everybody knows the story of the Misfits and all that stuff. Everybody knows, or we just spoke about Christian Death and the branching off of these two bands. How about this? TSOL, right? Original lineup. One by one, <clears throat> the original lineup dissolves. First, the lead singer and the drummer leave. That, you know, like slowly they, they, that leaving just the nucleus of the guitarist and the bassist, kind of like with uh, Jerry and Doyle. So they get a new drummer and they get a new singer. Then the, the, the guitarist leaves, just leaving the bass player as the sole original member of TSOL. They start playing their, their sound changes to like, you know, hair metal, 80s hair metal. They I start, remember. yeah, they get really friendly with uh, Guns N' Roses and, and they're doing the whole, you know, strip scene or whatever, the LA strip scene. And then what happens is Mike, the bass player, the last founding original member of the band, he leaves the band. And it's just, Four guys who were any. <laughs> that's like that's like GBH. Like GBH, the same thing happened. To really, all the, all the original members left GBH, but it's now, uh, it, and they're still going. I, I, at least I think they're still. That going. That is so bizarre. I think the Vandals are like that too. But when that happens, that blows my mind. When that stuff happens, I find it like fascinating because I'm like, how can you continue as an entity that you didn't create in any way, shape, or form? Like. You know, it's one thing if someone was there at the beginning, but like it just, I don't know. The whole thing kind of blows my mind. Uh, and that's what happened with TSOL. Kind of weird. Kind of crazy. Hold on. Let's go to some of these comments real quick. Um, Manson's first album was called Port. Oh, we already saw that one. Uh, Port, get the Port of an American Family. That's what it is. Right. Okay. Right. Um, Glory is Noise TV says, get the book Phantoms, a 600 page. Oral history of LA Death Rock. That is cool. Wow. I will check that out. Yeah. Um, if Jerry only asked Mike to rejoin the Misfits, Glenn not being available, would Mike consider it? We'll get to all the Misfits stuff in a little bit. We're not there yet. We'll we'll, we'll talk about all that stuff. We'll we'll get there. I don't want to let, let's let's wait. Let's wait a little bit before we go down that path. Um, Nicholas and Zena, because I'm having fun talking about Death Rock. Well, guys, I well, of course we'll talk about that stuff. Uh, Nicholas and Zena did the talk show circuit during the satanic panic. Gotcha. Um, same with Napalm Death. No, okay, so there's no original members in uh Napalm Death. Now I'm gonna say something, Mike, that is super duper uh controversial, but I I and I stand by this. I stand by this statement because it, the band is not a sacred cow to me. I stand by this statement because I didn't like 
grow up with this band. It's not like an institution, even though it is an institution and a super influential band. You probably disagree with me. I'm just going to say this. I prefer Ronnie James Dio Sabbath to Ozzy Osbourne Sabbath. And when it comes to singing live Sabbath songs, I will take Ronnie James Dio every day of the week over Ozzy and my 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 proof my my evidence to this is if you listen to the bonus disc on Mob Rules from 1981 which was the second I think it was the first or second Dio uh uh Sabbath album they play they play live at the Hammersmith or whatever and that band is tight like a motherfucking tiger they are so <laughs> Oh my God, they are phenomenal, and they got uh, what's his face from Carmine? What's his face from um, uh, Carmine? Uh, fuck the the van- uh, brother, of the Vanilla Fudge guy. Um, whatever they have, they have a new lineup, and they sound great. That's an example where that I think works out really, really well. Oh my God, we have we got people unsubscribing because I just said that. The, <laughs> Okay, um, Austin's asking, how did you befriend Peter Steele? What happened? How did you meet Peter Steele and type one negative? That's a really good question. Uh, He had just come back from a a typo negative tour, and they were going to do a special carnivore show at the Limelight. So once again, I head off to the Limelight after having made arrangements to do an interview with Peter before the show. So I go to the show. Uh, I go backstage. I see Peter sitting down with his, uh, at the time, manager, Kenny. <clears throat> I walked up. I introduced myself. I handed him a CD of Empire Hideous. I'm like, hey, here you go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we started talking. And I, I asked him a bunch of questions. And um, he was very, very polite to me, as he was to everybody. And uh, that was the end of that. So he plays a show. Time goes by, I don't know, maybe about a year or so. Empire Hideous plays a gig uh, at the bank in New York City. Uh, It was a a sold-out show. There was about 750 people at the gig. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget this. I was standing on stage doing the show. And in the back of the club, like 100 yards away, I see this guy standing above everybody with with like a, a... what looked like a, a policeman's hat on you know, yeah, and, and a leather jacket. And I've seen those pictures. Yeah. All the ways in the back. I've so seen that outfit. Yeah. After the show, we go downstairs into the dressing room and the promoter of the show comes up and says, Hey, Peter Steele from typo negative is here. He wants to meet you. I said, okay. So he comes down and we began to talk and he goes, you came to the limelight to do the interview when I was doing the carnivore show. I was like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. We talked some more. <clears throat> and then, um, to me and this was a an icebreaker he says to me i want empire hideous to go on tour with typo negative wow and i was like wow i would be honored now at the time with typo electric hellfire club and lycia which was a band from project very ethereal band and i don't know if you know do you know who electric hellfire club is i never heard of either band uh the two that you just named the the lead singer thomas was in a band at one time called thrill kill cult that i've heard of okay they they were an industrial band yeah yeah Uh, so so thomas thomas left he formed his own band uh electric hellfire club which uh was also a, a sort of an industrial rock band if you will yeah so i was asked to be part of that tour Wow. However, we got hit with a major uh, uh, inconvenience when right like the very like next day, the whole band used to live like Empire Hit us. We used to all live together in a house in Kearney, New Jersey. The very next day after getting asked to go on tour, we were handed an eviction notice. So now I got to think about moving in, in however many months and I, I couldn't take the tour. However, Peter and I remained friends, and there were two other times after that in which he asked me to go on tour. All three times, there was a circumstance in which I was unable to go. 
and I was ready to go. It was either a musician that wasn't in the band or, you know, we were in the process of moving or some other bullshit, but it was just always like, it was never meant to be. Now, let me jump to one thing. I got to tell you, go ahead, go ahead. So now a while back I had done a film where we interviewed Peter Steele. Okay. This, this was in uh, 2010, I believe. Yeah. Possi possibly two. Yeah. 2010. Yeah. It might even been 2009. Anyhow. So we go to the Peter's house who he was living in Scranton at the time. Right. And uh, we do the interview. Mm -hmm. It was the last interview he would ever do. Right. While I was there, he asked me, he's like, Mike, so what are you doing with, you know, music with Empire Idiots? I said, Peter, I said, you know what? I, I can't, I can't be part of it anymore. I said, I, I'm retiring. I said, I, I've been, I've put 20 years into this. I just can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So he said, so I, I said, the only thing I'm doing is I'm releasing my last final album, my, my final studio album of Empire Hades, which was called The Time Has Come. He said to me, you want any help with that? I said, yeah. I said, do you want to produce it? He's like, yeah. I said, great. I said, I'll get you everything you need. So as the weeks went by, I sent them all the, the 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 finished recordings we had, the demos, the lyrics, everything. Meanwhile, he begins what's called pre-production and starts setting up ideas. And we're going back and forth on the telephone. He loved the record. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he even we even agreed to do a cover. Uh, we did a cover by uh, you know the Cars are right. The Cars. Yes. Yes. We we did a cover by the Cars called "Moving in Stereo," which was from their first huh. record. And it was one of Peter's favorite songs. And I told him mine huh. too. So I said, let's, let's do it. So we, nice. Every, everything set up the day he died. Most people don't know this. The day he died, he was literally working on my CD. Wow. Prepping production so that we could, you know, get it fine, like finalize it. And he began having heart problems. Uh, his girlfriend, Pam, showed up. They called the ambulance. He gets taken out in the ambulance. In the ambulance, in front of his apartment, is where he died. Mm. And they they tried, they, you know, the, the ambulance was out there for quite a while. Because Pam told me this. She told me everything that happened. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, Mike, he was working on your stuff when when he had the heart problems and, and eventually got taken away in the ambulance. You know what's kind of weird to think in in a in a in a retrospective kind of way, it's possible that the last music, the last songs that Peter Steele ever listened to in his life was Empire Hideous music. Yeah. If that's the case, right? Yeah, I mean that's yeah. crazy. Well, wow. it is the case because he was yeah. working. He was he right, knows, right. Like that's what I mean. On. Everyone's yeah, was on the computer. Pam told me like she came home, all the notes were on the on the desk. The computer was open. He was listening to the music, and then what happened happened. So, so he, so the last music that Peter Steele was ever listening to was Empire Hades music. It's kind of crazy. And again, here's the strange thing: it's almost like every single time him and I were supposed to do something together, somehow fate intervened and pulled it apart. Yeah. So. I couldn't even get him to produce the record because death came and took him away. So it was just pretty effed up no matter how you look at it. It's that's really sad. And I'm really sorry that, that, that it went down the way that it went down, but you know what, at least you got to hang out with him for his last interview ever and spend some, some quality time together. And, you know, um, there's a, I, I like this mentality of gratitude where it's like, you know, you could be thankful for the stuff you get. You could be thankful for the stuff that's taken right. away and you can be thankful for the stuff that's left behind, you know, and it just don't get to choose what that is. Sometimes he, he tried to get me signed to a record deal for Roadrunner records twice. The first time. Wow. Was, yeah. The first time he actually brought uh, a guy from Roadrunner records because there's so much politics involved. Like if you want to go on right. tour with a signed band, you can't right. be not, not signed to a label. You have to have a label backing you up because there's publicity involved. There's money involved, uh, you know, all promotion involved. Of course. And so, you know, we couldn't get on because we didn't have a, a serious record label. We were independent. Right. 
so that was the first time I forget the guy he brought to uh he brought to the to the uh show, but the guy walked out. He wasn't interested. And and, and this is a guy who signed Slipknot. Um right. Anyhow, the second time, is it a second time, second or third time, he came to me and said, Listen, I want you to go on tour, but I'll pay you out of my pocket. He said, You'll have to pay for your own gas, you'll have to pay for food, but I'll get the I'll get the hotel rooms and I'll pay you for the show. But you know, because we were still independent. The problem right. was I had a I had van, my engine had just blown. Now I had to spend two thousand dollars on getting a brand new engine, and I couldn't even do it. It was just every every time was was a, a cluster. Murphy's Law, was, man, absolutely. just pure Murphy, pure it's, Murphy's Law. It's like we were just made not to work together. It, it really blew my mind. That is that is mind blowing. Hold on one second. We got some comments here. Uh, Loki says that he likes the hat. I I think he's talking about my hat, Mike. I, I don't think so. he's talking about your your hat. My hat is um, simple. Glory is noise TV says fun fact. The graves era misfits did their first ever live appearance during that type O electric hellfire club light Lycia tour at the chance at Poughkeepsie Poughkeepsie on October 30th, 1995. And then they went to Coney Island, right? And they did a, a, a set on Halloween night too, all wearing the same misfit shirt, which looked really goofy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that show because after uh, when I had actually joined Misfits, Doyle, yeah. Doyle came and asked me. He said to me, "Yeah, do you think Typo Negative sabotaged my uh, guitar rig so that I couldn't play? Because that's what happened. His guitar went out, and it what? was just Jerry on yeah, it was just Jerry on bass, Chud on drums, and Michael singing, and no guitar, and it was out for like." three songs maybe and i was like oh that's man. crazy it was yeah it was, i was at the hammerstein ballroom in new york city halloween huh. night um glory is the noise tv also says kenny from type o uh sang two songs with jerry doyle and then graves came out and sang doyle's then wife sue filmed it who knows if it's ever been distributed anywhere maybe sue also filmed that coney island show as well your favorite song is Skulls. That's great. R.I.P. Peter Steele. The story is heartbreaking. It is a damn shame. Peter Steele was the one uh, was the one told the Misfits that Graves was their singer. Yes, we know the story. Messed up. R.I.P. Green Man. Uh, my favorite. Yes, we know your favorite so song is Skulls. You said that already. Thank uh, you for letting you. us know. <laughs> and Jed, yeah, Jed Clampett hat. You could say it's a Jed Clampett hat. This is my goth hat. <laughs> Boy, Mike, Mike, I didn't say any of these things, Mike. I just put on the hat. I just put on the hat, Mike. That's I know. It. I know. <laughs> Probably looks um, a lot better on your wife. <laughs> yes, it uh, it definitely does. It definitely does. She looks like a model with it. I look like a fat, weird. <laughs> I, I have I have a thing for women in hats. I, I have a real fetish for women in hats. I love Hey, hats. there you go. I love hats on women. Hey, love it. They, I, I like, I like, I like, I like. Uh, I'm a backward. I like the backwards baseball hat on girls, like the skater girls, the backball, kind of like a tomboy thing, but like kind of. I don't know. I think it's very cute. In I any case, any, any hat to me looks good. On okay, me. any hat for any hat for Mike. That's fine. <laughs> oh, oh, Loki's favorite song is Skulls as oh. well. Uncle Jeff, that hat looks like some that that looks like a hat Johnny Depp Johnny would Depp. wear. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Fat Johnny Depp. All right, let's. All right, ready, ready. We're gonna do, Mike. You know, you know Wayne's World, right? So we're gonna do yeah. the dreams. We're gonna do the. Doodly, 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 doodly. We're gonna go back in time now. Okay. Doodly, 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 doodly. <laughs> yeah, Mike. Mike's doing it too. Doodly, doodly, doodly. We're going back, back. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. We're going back. Hold on. We got more comments. Vacation hat, guys. You interrupted my flashback. What the hell? Um, <laughs> well, honestly, I can see the typo guys messing with Doyle. When Typo toured with Pantera, they pranked and messed with each other through the whole tour. There you go. Uh, Kevin45 is in the house. Hey, Mike, I filmed your band at Stimulate in 2018. I am the videographer of the party uh, for Chris. There you go. I know wait, Kevin. Wait, wait, go, hold on a second. Wait, what, what, what was his name? His his name is Kevin, but Kevin the party. From, yeah. Kevin yeah. from. Uh, uh, Kevin45. Uh, 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 wait, wait, from Access Video? 
Um, I don't know if it's from Axis. He's Von Vonisper Studios. That's like his. He does a lot of stuff. He's into a lot of the music that we like um, as well. Do you know the Red Party? Kevin showed me what the Red Party yeah, was. Yeah, 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 stuff. yeah, yeah. That's in New York City. You but know. this this guy he says, "Nope, not Axis." Okay. Okay. Not access. Actually, it's A X I S. Okay. Thank you. I, I I'm not familiar with this. Cheers from Argentina, Mike. We love your music. Um, my favorite song is Hybrid Moments. My second favorite song is Skulls. Everybody loves Skulls. Kevin wants to know why I call him 45. Because when I store people in my phone, I always give a little nickname if I don't know people's last names. And Kevin and I went to a 45 grave show. And okay. so I wow. just stored him in the phone as Kevin 45, which is what I've always thought of him as Kevin 45. And that's I, I think, I think Diana Cantor is actually dating a friend of mine in really. Cal yeah. Last I talked to him, he said, yeah, he said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm dating, uh, Diana Cantor. Hey, just so you know, Mike, Dan's favorite song is skulls. Guess what? I, I don't care. No, I'm just effing with you. Man. I, I hate that song. I'm not a big fan of that song. My favorite misfit song is Die Die My Darling. That that and, really? and, and that and Vampira. Let me ask you this. What is if you're okay, so I guess those are the songs you pick to introduce someone to the misfits. Here's let me ask you this question. One song, I'll tell you what, I'll give you two. We'll get okay. since we're both misfits fans. I know you love the misfits, even well, despite everything. We we both love the misfits, right? So let's come from this from the before all that and just come from it from the perspective of listening to the misfits. All right. You get two songs to introduce someone to the misfits. It has to be songs that personify. We're not talking about resurrected misfits. We're talking about 77 to 83 the Danzig era misfits. You can pick two songs. Okay, Vampire. Vampire. And Die, Die, My Darling. Uh, yeah. I, well, I mean, I guess that was obvious because you already goddamn said them. I was, I was the, hoping to do something. Those are my two all-time favorite misfits. Okay. I have others, but those are the two yeah. top. And anything on, on Earth AD is just like ripping, ripping. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about that. I'm going to pick – I've said this before, but I'm just going to say it because I want to say it right now. I pick Astro Zombies and Night of Living Dead. Those are the yeah. two songs that I – what? You don't like Night of Living Dead? What the – what? What? I, you know why? I think why? I think I think my hatred of that song comes from listening to the 45 which was absolutely mm. terrible. That's terrible the worst recording. version of the song. That's oh. the, the absolute worst so version. That, of the song. that sticks in my head every time I think of that song like oh, hate that record. <laughs> Devil Rock. I actually I actually yeah. bought that record, the original For how much? 45. For how much? $10 in quarters oh from, from Erie Vaughn. <laughs> he took quarters back then. <laughs> $10 in quarters. I went to his house. And I said, listen, I want, I want to buy that record because he had gotten a couple from Glenn. And I said, yeah. look, I got I got a roll of quarters. for. <laughs> I got a roll of quarters I'll give you for the – he's like, all right, I'll take it. He goes, I can go play video games with this. <laughs> um, Devil Lock says, hey, Mike, all the best from the UK. And Paul says, man, Mike, you look so different, but he's glad that you are doing well and that you're healthy. Thank you. Uh, so cheers to that. Cheers to that. Devil horns for that. All right, so now we're going back in time. We, we were interrupted by the comments, which happens sometimes. Doodly, doodly, doodly. Okay, we're back in time. We're back in time. It's the 80s. First, before we even get to all that stuff, you, you mentioned it. I was actually going to ask you this question. You mentioned it. Tell me about trying to learn about underground shit. And I talked about this with Greg on his episode, Greg Vasilino. I want to hear from your perspective. What is it like to learn about underground music or just trying to learn about anything of that's like a counterculture or subculture in an age before the internet. Just talk about that for a little bit. Just set the tone for us. Okay. So I'll give an example. When I was, Great. when I was 16, I began to get into like, uh, Prior to 16, I was into heavy metal, you know, ACDC, Judas Priest, Kiss, Van Halen, uh, yeah. you know, all those bands. By yeah. age 16, I began to get into the new wave age. And uh, at the time, I used to visit record stores and I used to look through the albums and see what captured me. Now, now back then, you didn't always have opportunities where right. you'd go into a record store and they would put the record on so you can hear it. 
Yeah. So you had to take that chance and spend anywhere between five and twenty dollars on a record that you've never heard before, right? And decide whether or not it's good. So as time goes by, by the time I reach seventeen, now I start getting into hardcore punk rock. Yeah, uh, Minor Threat, the FUs, TSOL, uh, who else? To Cry, Seven Seconds. I I got into all these hardcore bands, and again, I would go to the record store. And I would flip through the, the records to find out which looked, you know, more punk rock, more hardcore than anything else. And I would buy them. Right. One of the two best albums I ever bought was uh, GBH, uh, City Baby Attacked by Rats, and uh, Discharge. Um, I forget the name of the album. But anyway, uh, two British bands that actually broke ground for, like, speed metal. Anywho... Um, so, you know, I, I used to have to spend money on, on these records and not know what I was getting in, in many Investments. cases. Exactly. So <laughs> then you could go to a place like at the time, Bleaker Bob's. It, it was a famous oh, yeah. record store in New York City, uh, I Best. believe on, on Thompson or Sullivan Street. I can't remember. I or think Third it was on Thompson. Street. Thompson Thompson and Third, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I used to go there and I became friends with not only the owner, but this guy, John, who used to work there. John DeSalva. Right. Dude, you know, I know John DeSalva, man, from the Tough Darts. He's from the Tough Darts, dude. So I would go there. And if I did pick out a record that I had never heard before, they were kind enough to put it on the turntable and play mm. it. So that became a really good opportunity. Um, but, you know, as, as I got older into my late, teens i was still into hardcore and death rock right and uh i would you know m my friends i would turn them on by you know making cassette tapes for them you know yeah. uh, in fact i, I got a guy cool. who who was into heavy metal back in the day he was still in high school and i made him a tape of uh, the exploited and gbh and he was a just a changed man you know so uh yeah, that's how you did it back then. You 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 usually made a cassette tape for somebody else to turn them on to the music that you thought was good. Uh, I'm just going to pause you real quick because we just want to go through these comments. Loki says, "In all seriousness, I credit Mike for helping me take a more serious approach to music. Up to that point, before I played with him, I was all about the fun jamming and all that." Wait, that's is that Loki from from yeah, Brave yeah, yeah, Man? Yeah. yeah, Mr. Yeah. Monster. Oh, okay, yeah. Loki. I know Loki. Loki actually played in Spy Society '99. My well, it's funny man. you say that because he literally says in this very comment while rehearsing for Spy, he says SS '99. Right. I saw how he approached a practice, saw the importance of being on time and being prepared. So Mike definitely helped mold a young. Loki, there you go, Mike. I didn't realize it was you, Loki. Uh, nice to hear from you, man. Nice to hear from you. I hope you're well. Um, Dan wants to know: Do you still have the Night of the Living Dead forty five? What happened to that sucker? Okay, after I got out of the Misfits. Now, let me just back up for a moment. In the day when I was young, okay, yeah. back when I was as far as at eighteen years old, seventeen, eighteen years, old, I began buying up all the forty fives and records that I pot colored vinyls, limited edition, right. whatever I could. From right. the Misfits, and by the time I had reached my early twenties, I had everything on vinyl for relatively decent prices. And in mm. fact, I had even gotten Jerry Doyle and Robo to sign most of the records, if not all of them. Nice. Um, so, in addition, I had also I was given uh, Jerry gave me one of Doyle's guitars. I had uh, Jerry. Oh my Dan god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! We have to talk about this guitar. I know right, hold, hold about this thought. guitar. Hold yeah, okay, go Let ahead. me go finish ahead. what I'm telling you. Yeah. Hold sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I had the guitar. I had um, uh, Jerry gave me, me flyers. He gave me right. envelopes from the day. He gave me, you know, those gigantic spikes they used to put on their leather jacket. Yeah. He gave me that. All kinds of stuff. He wanted to give me Sid Vicious's shoes. He wanted yeah. to give me, you know, that leather jacket he used to wear with the red collar. He wanted yeah. to give me that. And I was like, look, I can't take these things from me. But other stuff he gave me, I kept. Long story short, I had all this stuff. Then I joined the band in 1998. I had a very bad falling out. I was very disappointed on how they let me go after I, right. I literally changed my whole life. Right. So about a year or two goes by and I'm like, you know what? Screw this. I yeah. was in the band. I don't need the collections anymore. Right. So I, I just basically, you know, I had 
versions of them. Uh, you know, I, I had like either either I had either burned it on a CDR or whatever. I said, you know, right. what? I don't I don't need the originals anymore. So I sold them all. So I sold my whole collection for about five grand. Wow. I mean, that's in in 19. What did you say? That was so that would have been that 1999 money. 2000. OK, listen, that's a good that's a nice little chunk of change. Back then. You know, it was, did yeah. Your thing. Yeah. yeah, you did your thing. Eric wants to know what Misfit songs were your favorite, least favorite to sing live? Everything from the uh, the new album uh, uh, with Graves on it. What the hell was it called? Uh, American Psycho. American Psycho. I, I hated that. Record. Yeah, you hated doing that. Yeah. Understandable. Understandable. Now wait, before you go to the next one, you had to ask yeah. me a question about that uh, about the guitar. Yeah. Okay. So well, hold on, real quick. I just want to highlight Dagger Love, who who sent a tip. Dagger Love, thank you for the support as always. Really appreciate you, bro. Um, and he says, I miss shooting the shit with Mike. At Angela and Lori's in Lodi. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't oh know. my God! I don't What's know his name? Who... What's his name? It's his name is Dagger Love, and he That's comes on real. my. Sh he's always commenting, and he's been he's been a presence here and contributing. But I don't know. He's a mystery man. So Dagger Love, you have That's to reveal funny. yourself now so that we know who you are. So please identify yourself while I ask Mike about the guitar. So that guitar, Mike, recently went on auction. Um, I don't know how much it sold for. You know, that guy it, lied to me. That guy lied to me because he contacted me about, well, I guess he contacted me last year okay. and said to me, he asked me to write him an authenticity paper right. indicating where it came from, who he bought it from, you know, all, all yeah. me. And so I did that. And I, I wrote to him. I was like, so what are you doing with this guitar? What are you selling it? He's like, oh, no, I just wanted to insure it. So you're full of shit, asshole. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> What's interesting, though, that guitar was it meant to be smashed at a Misfits show, and they never – they built it to be broken at a Misfits show, and it never got broken. And it's One a many. weird – it's a weird, awkward-looking – was it hard to, like, hold that guitar? It looks so well, weird. I wish well, I had a you got to remember the person who was playing it is over six feet tall and built like Frankenstein. Right. So it, right. when, he, when he held it, it didn't hit the ground. When I held it, Mr. Five Foot Six, uh, it's in the shape of a bat. So it's a flying. Hold on. I found it. I found it. Okay. So it's a flying V. And I'm then so they excited put right now. The bat wings over the flying V guitar, so which yep. were made out of uh, uh, of press board. And so it was so big from wing tip to wing tip that it literally hit the ground. If I if I had put it on me, there it is. That's, That's it. it. That's that it. Used, Look at that this. Used to be, that used to be. That used to be. That used to be hanging on my wall in almost every apartment or or house that I lived in. It's a bat. If if you turn it upside down, it's a That's bat right. with the wings. Wow. Yep. What a weird, awkward guitar. Mm hmm. Oh my god. Yeah. So that was meant to be destroyed. It's signed by Jerry. Only you can see it right here. That's right. I still have the marker that he signed it with. Wow. That is that is bananas. So that's anybody, anybody want to buy it? Two thousand dollars. Yeah. Two thousand dollars <laughs> for a marker touched by Jerry for the kids. Hey, and we're, we're, we're going to make t-shirts out of the marker too, so you'll get a yeah. t-shirt with the marker on it. <laughs> Good evening, Mister Mail Prick. I love this dude's last name is Mail Prick. He's in Mail Bradford. Prick. Yeah, he he comes on the show sometimes. And he just, I, I, how you doing, Mister Mailprick? Good to see you. Um, Spawn. It was supposed to be smashed at the final show, says Chris. I did not know that. I didn't know it was supposed to be the final show. Um, if touring and live shows happen again, do you think you'll ever play in England? Would be epic. Maybe at the Gothic Weekend at Whitby. That's where I saw. So remember when I told you I saw Alien Sex Fiend when they opened up for the band I was touring with? That was where we were at. We were in Whitby at the Gothic we Weekend. And Whitby is where uh, Bram Stoker based and like wrote Dracula is based on Whitby. And it's like a huge, it's like a goth mecca, man. Like goths, they come from all over to be at that place. Really interesting. Well to tell you the truth, Mr. Devilock, I, I don't know for sure because everything, everything is on hold right now. Initially, Momento Morte was going to do a tour of South America in November of this year. But at this point, we don't know what's happening. Theaters mm. are closed. Concert festivals aren't happening. Like, we don't know what's happening. So we had to just cancel. If anything happens, 
it'll be in 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 autumn of 2022. Let's hope everybody. Let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope you the know, world gets back to normal again. I predicted this. I said that 2021 was going to be a transition year. There's no way that it was everything was just going to be full tilt boogie after 2020. So 2022, I think we can look forward. But let, wait, wait, we're getting distracted here. Let's go back. We're going back in time again. Okay, we're back in time. Um, so you that's how you found out about found out information. How did you meet Jerry and Doyle initially? Okay. Very, very good question. Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> let's see. I'm 20 years old. Yeah. And I'm living in a trailer park in Fairfield, New Jersey, right by Willowbrook oh. Mall. I was living with a girl at the time. And mm -hmm. we were on our last legs of our relationship. It was just a mess. Yeah. <clears throat> One day, I went to go visit a friend of mine who had an art studio in Patterson, New Jersey, this guy, Reggie. And so I'm hanging out with Reggie, uh, who, by the way, his son is the drummer for Empire Hideous. Hmm. So I'm hanging out at Reggie's place and these two guys are there and I cannot remember their name for the life of me. But um, while we're there, I had this, this, this denim jacket, which I had painted uh, one of my images on the back and up in the corner, I had I had I had painted Misfits and Sam Hain. So while I'm at my friend Reggie's house, this um, this other guy I don't remember his name. Let's call him Joe for the sake of argument. Joe, so his name's Joe. Joe. Sloppy Joe. Sloppy Joe. So Joe sees my 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 denim jacket with the painting on it. He goes, oh, he goes. He says, oh, the Misfits. He goes, that's my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law was in that band. What? I said, what? I, who? He's like Jerry. I'm like. No. Now, mind you, at the time, at that point in my life, the Misfits were the yeah. biggest inspiration to me at that point from from like from like 17 until, you know, whenever. So uh, I said to him, wait a minute, oh, you're Jerry's brother in law. He's like, yeah, he's married to my sister. OK, I said, listen, I would love to speak with him. I said, here's my phone number. I gave him my card. I said, please ask Jerry to call me. So, a couple of weeks go by. I, I'm I'm in I'm in I'm in, I'm, in, I'm, in my, I'm in my trailer park in 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 Fairfield, New Jersey. It's now I used to get up late, but I get a call at like eight thirty in the morning. Yeah, the phone rings. I'm like, hello. He's like, yeah, is this brother Mike? I'm like, Who's this? He's like, this is Jerry only. I went. <laughs> I almost fell out of bed. I talked to him for like two hours on the phone that day. And he, he told me so many different things. He said, listen, come up and visit me. I'll show you around. I'm doing this new band, Christ the Conqueror. And you right. can come up, come up and see us. And I'm like, okay. So that's how I, I actually ended up meeting Jerry. Uh, he invited me up to the warehouse in, in, right. in Vernon. In, in you went Vernon. to the, the pro edge factory, pro right? Edge, right. Yeah. Congruent. And um, yeah. so I went up there. I got to meet him, Doyle, and Robo. They actually played a bunch of Christ the Conqueror songs. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Robo was playing Christ the Conqueror well, too? Yeah, I remember, this was still 1987. Yeah, Robo but I never, it's never known. No, no one ever said that Robo was in or playing Christ well, the let Conqueror me, let songs. Let me finish, let me finish. Yeah, here's, sorry, here's, here's what happened. Basically, Jerry and Doyle had this, this vision for this this metal band which was influenced right. by, by iron maiden right and they, they named it christ the conqueror now robo right. robo who used to work for congruent in the right. machinery shop for jerry's right. dad mm -hmm. he lived on the premises and they were all friends so right. they asked they asked Do uh, robo to play drums for their rehearsals he did it but ultimately at that point Robo didn't really want to be part of it. And eventually they found another guy that they called Murph. the Murph. Murph, Murph right. Murph. The, Murph, the, Murph and real quick, Mike, His that's real the name was Jim. <laughs> okay. Well, well, the Murph, who I think is Jim Murphy, he, right. he's the only person in the world that has a Christ the Conqueror tattoo. Only one in existence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get the picture. Hold on. Keep talking. <laughs> Keep talking. Second. Keep talking. <laughs> 
I know. Wait, keep talking. Keep talking. I'm going to find the tattoo to show you because I want you to laugh about it. Keep, keep going. Keep, keep telling the story. Keep telling the story. Just, just excuse me while I – okay, well, while, you're, while you tell me the story, I'm going to locate the, the photo. I, it's an amazing specimen. It's literally I, I, like – it's a collector's right item. I have the CD right here, Christ the Conqueror. I, I don't know where I put it. March uh, of the Megamites. Oh, March of the Megamites. <laughs> Anywho. Hey, uh, hey, we're going to do a song. It's called March of the Megamites. It's going to be huge. It's going to be great. It's going to do great. <laughs> oh, my God. What a, what a – wow. So, anyway, uh, yeah, eventually Robo was out. They got Jim Murphy. And right. uh, I remember they did a, a, an in-store signing at Tower Records in New York City on Lafayette Street. Um. And, uh, you know, you know, as well as I do, and any misfit fan knows that Christ the Conqueror was a complete, excuse me, flop. Yeah. Uh, he, he spent over 80 grand. Now I auditioned 80 grand, thing. 80 grand. He spent on Christ the Conqueror. I'm recording it. I'm recording. In addition, <laughs> I ended up, I ended up auditioning for that band. I, I mean, I, now try to understand where I was. I was a young yeah. kid. I was 20 years old, 20, 21 years old. I was mm -hmm. so, you know, starstruck by Jerry and Doyle. Mm -hmm. These are two guys who were big influences to me. I, in fact, the first day I showed up, I had my devil locked down. I, you know, makeup. On. I, I was like, I want to look cool, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So, um, I probably looked like a dork, but anywho, I, I, you know, I, I, I go there, and it was when I was in the hospital for my illness that Jerry actually came to visit me and handed me all the lyrics and a cassette tape and said, "Listen, learn the lyrics." And come audition for the band. Okay. So I took it really seriously. You know, I, I went out, I bought my, like what, a, a $250 microphone, a mic stand and everything. I was all excited. So I go and audition. They didn't like, they didn't like my, my style. And eventually the next person they got was Jeff Scott Soto. Who right. was the, the lead singer for Ingve Malmsteen. And they paid him something like four or five grand to do. But he's uncredited, course. right? They had to keep it on, they had to keep it on the low because of Probably. his contract. Something probably, like that. probably. I told him I would have done it for like two hundred bucks, right? <laughs> <You know>? Right. <laughs> um, but it is what it is. I'm glad that it never came to fruition because, now, frankly, that was a that was a stupid band. It really. Well, was. let me ask you this. This is what this is what I find. Or this is what I'm always. And by the way, I am looking for the tattoo to show hey, you. Hold as on. I, I, I got to show you something. I got to show Go you ahead. something. I have. Go right ahead. Here. Go ahead. I'm going to fill in the dead air while Mike gets his thing. Um, man, I, a, a bunch of little tidbits that I didn't know about Christ the Conqueror that Mike is revealing because Mike was there at that time. Okay, here we go. What is he going to show us? What Christ the, the Conqueror. All right. This was a, a story written out. I don't know if you can see it here. Yeah, keep, this yeah, is hold, a story. Hold what? This is a whole story that uh, my friend Reggie had gotten commissioned Oh to my God! Right for Jerry. Jerry came up with the basic notes, and I even have the handwritten version by Jerry himself. If I can find it, I'll show it to you right now. I that, got a whole wait. bunch of stuff I'm selling by Christ the Conqueror. It's all on my website. Is that wait? Question: Is that guy? So guys, you could buy this stuff directly from Mike on his website. Um, Mike, question: yeah. Was that for like a was that for like a, a comic book or something? Yes. Here's the original written by Jerry. Look at that. And it, it was, was a time known as the dark era. Darkness <laughs> was the <laughs> megamites. <laughs> Look at that thing. Yep. That is it, amazing. I don't know how many pages it is, but it looks like it's at least 20. Um, but yeah, I have all this stuff that's up. Yeah, 21 pages. All handwritten stuff by Jerry, who then handed it to my friend Reggie, who then did this basic layout for a comic right. strip. And um I got a whole bunch of stuff I'm selling that's on my my website. Mike, I have the website. I have your website in the description. So if anybody wants to see, just go to the description of what you're watching. Literally, you're watching us. Just go look down here. Click on Mike's website. You'll see MikeHideous.com or whatever it was. I copy pasted it from you. And you can find it. You'll find it on Mike's website. So if you want to buy and own some of this, this stuff, you can. Um, so now here's my question. Now, now, didn't Jerry had had switch over? There you go. There's one of the CDs. That, talk about a collector's one item. Thing. One more thing. Hold on. One more thing. Go ahead. Here we go. 
pen light flashlights. All right. Pen light flashlights. There you are. Yeah. Here, have a pen light flashlight for the kids. Ah. I even had one that said the Doyle fan club and they work too, by the way. Wow. Yeah, the Doyle Fan Club man, which uses the fan club list from the original Mr. As, a, fan as club. a matter of fact, yeah, the first the first red Doyle Fan Club T-shirts were yeah. the, the 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 silk screen was made by yours truly. Wow, really? Yep, I was there. I helped Jerry print fifty T-shirts the first time around when when we in back in like nineteen eighty nine eighty eight. Hold on, like I'm going to show you this right now, real quick, before we move yeah. on and continue further. Oh, <laughs> I would Only get that one in existence. No, I, never. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. no. Right. It's that is. Listen, it is a. I, you know, I. We we all had a good laugh when Merp when Merp rolled up his sleeve and showed that to me. I was at Sal B's oh. house. We were doing the rock and roll cooking show. We were we were literally on Gro Grove Street in Lodi, right down the street from where Jerry and Doyle used to live, and. Merp rolls up. Merp was also almost a drummer for the Misfits at one point. Before he was gonna, he chose marriage over the Misfits. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what a smart move! <laughs> and and you know, I mean, like you know, like he rolls up his sleeve. I'm like, I'm like, oh my god, this is the only tattoo in existence. I was like, I have to document this, so I just took a yeah. picture of it. Wow! And I don't think anybody has a Christ the Conqueror tattoo except for I the Merp. Doubt it. I sincerely Amazing. doubt it. Not so even you, Jared Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you showed me something I never saw before, and I showed you something that you've never seen before. That's amazing, man. Wow. But, you um, know, I, I was yeah, going to say right. that the, the whole thing with the Christ the Conqueror stuff is uh, it didn't go very well for them. And I, since I right. knew Jerry back then, he gave me a lot of stuff. And right. um, you painted a cardboard cutout, too. That was at that's Tank's right. house. That's right. I, oh, Tank's, oh, Tank has it? Dude, I went to Tank's house to interview Kenny. No for my way. documentary that you're also, for those of you who don't know, Mike and I first met because Mike didn't interview for my Misfits documentary, but not talking about the 95 Misfits, only talking about old school Misfits. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, uh, and so for that documentary, I also interviewed Jerry and Doyle, I have a third brother, Kenny. And so I interviewed Tank and I interviewed Kenny at Tank's house, right in Vernon, right where they all live. And, and right in the corner was a cardboard cutout of, I don't know if it was a sword or if it was like a more of a stand-up. There was a couple of things. And he's like, yeah, Mike Hideous painted those. I was like, holy crap. Yep. And, and as of 2011, Tank still had those. I don't know if he still does, wow. but that's stuff that you painted. And so, so the idea was, though, so this is what's weird. And not many people have seen actual pictures of Christ the Conqueror let alone see them in the flesh it's, like Mike has. It's, it's a weird, what do you, do you remember anything of what? Jer yeah, yeah. Doyle, Doyle, or no, Jerry had this fencing mask. Yes! With All the, right, a fencing mask with, with the, the spikes, spikes going right down the center of the, 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 the yep. middle of the, of the fencing mask. And then there were, the, they had necklaces with these fake claws on them and everything. <laughs> It was it was amazing. Silly, man. I got pictures. Amazing. I got pictures. I can't get them now. They're in a photo album. But I got pictures from when they did uh, the record uh, store, the in store signing at Tower Records, and they were all dressed up in their their you know outfits. Wow, it was, it was just silly. It was just silly. um yeah, and it just did. And then let me ask you this because I this not much is known about this time. That's why it's so fascinating to talk to you about this, even more so than like Misfits '95. Um, what, so what happened? So, so again, for anybody, for anybody who is unaware at some point, and maybe Mike can fill in the, the holes. Cause I don't know at some point, I think Jerry and Doyle's father is like, what are you stupid? Like go after, go after the, the misfits name, go get that misfits thing going. So they hire one lawyer. The first lawyer doesn't work out. They get a second lawyer. They start doing a bunch of lawsuit stuff. And this is my question for Mike. Right. When right. does the shift happen where they're like, this Christ the Conqueror stuff is going nowhere? When does Dr. Chud come into the picture? Wasn't he Christ the Conqueror drummer too? And then it became the Misfits? Like what, do you ha have any like information about this? All right. I can't, I cannot uh, give any information about Chud. I only knew Chud. Right. After he became the Misfits drummer, gotcha. That's, okay, that's all I knew about Chud. right. 
Uh, as far as when I first met Jerry, in fact, I also have paperwork from the lawsuit that uh, wow. he gave me. Yeah. Um, because initially what Jerry had me doing until I realized what I was doing was betrayal. Jerry had me going out buying misfit bootlegs to, ah. so that he could use them in court. Yeah, now, to track stuff down. Now, yeah. I have something that nobody has. I have a video documentary of me videotaping all the all of my records. Right. All, all of my misfit records while Jerry does the narration of who was on the record when it was recorded, how much was paid for it, and, and who did what. So now I have, I have a copy of that. No one else has it except maybe a lawyer who probably threw it out. You gotta, you better digitize it before that tape rots. Right. Make sure that yeah. gets digitized. I've been doing that lately, actually. Good. So anyway, my point Good. was this. Yeah. Um, so when I first met Jerry, he was already in the process of doing the paperwork to lay out to take Glenn to court. Right. Now the first the first uh, lawyer he hired was not an entertainment lawyer, so the guy was not exactly. Yeah, he sucked, right? He, he wasn't know, good. Yeah, well, he just didn't know how that business worked. Gotcha. Here's what really bothered me, as the as the lawsuit progressed, Jerry took notes on the things that he did. Now you got to keep in mind, Glenn wrote all the music, all the mm -hmm. rhythm, all the lyrics composition and so when you do that you are essentially the prime writer of the song once you write right. the the melody and, and and the lyrics and you composite right. it together it is your song so now right. if anybody else in the band if a drummer hits a cymbal that wasn't actually you know part of uh, uh or does a drum roll or something that wasn't actually part of the melody that song still belongs to the writer. Right. So what Jerry did, Jerry was writing notes on, okay, so the song... Uh, Devil's Hate, Warehouse. The song Hate Breeders. Okay, so when the song Hate Breeders is playing and you hear the part that goes, whoa, I sing that. So he wrote down, like literally wrote down the, the letters, O, O, H, O, O, H, 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 O, H, 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 H. I, I did that. That was my part. I wrote that. And he wanted royalties for that. So he has me buying these records and I realize I'm like, what am I, what am I doing? I'm actually helping him set up a lawsuit against Glenn Danzig. I had nothing against Glenn Danzig. Right. I actually liked Glenn Danzig. I liked right. Sam, yeah, Sam Hain and yeah. Danzig. So I eventually realized what was happening and I'm like, you know what? I don't know if I want to be part of this. And I, I backed away. I was still yeah. his friend. I, I knew Jerry and Doyle for 11 years before right. I joined the band in 1998. So I kind of was kind of disturbed that I was being used as a, if you will, a pawn for right. lack of a better term to go out, buy these records, and use them in a lawsuit against Glenn Danzig. I, I, I really, but you know, my defense is that I was young. I was heavily influenced just being around Jerry and like, you know, he's, your, a, he's your hero, man. He's my hero. I used to smoke yeah. a joint with the guy, you know, I used to right. play, I used to go up and hang out with his, his family. I mean, he was a friend of mine. Right. And, uh, you know, it just, I, I saw I things I, uh, to me. I stepped back and from a perspective, I saw things that I felt weren't exactly what you would let a friend do. Gotcha. I kind of felt used. Gotcha. Um, but what's interesting is, but when is the, when is there, is there a moment or is there a time where they're like, this Christ the Conqueror thing is not clicking? I was going to answer that too. Go ahead. So, the closer we got to 1995, Jerry had switched gears and realized he wanted he wanted the, the misfits to come back. And I'll, I remember when the when the when the coffin uh, box set came out for the misfits with all the songs, 
that was released by Roadrunner Records. First of all, they settled out of court with Glenn for something like, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, $2 million? Was that um, it, was? it was It was with Caroline Records, not right. Roadrunner, I don't think, right? But they, they – Caroline, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. And they they settled out of court. They got like a, I don't know two million dollars. They million. paid. They paid the settlement. You know, they paid. The, none of the money came out of Glenn's pocket. It came from. That's right. It came from Carol. The, yeah. The reason Caroline. the reason the box set was released was to make money back yeah. for right. all the money that they had spent on right. the the lawsuit. Just to free and, it up. Yeah. And as I as I said, you know, Jerry got everybody involved too. And, and as a matter of fact, he got everybody involved. Almost everybody. Except Almost everybody. Bobby Steele. Bobby Steele. Which I was blown away. I mean, this guy and Joey Image. I don't think Joey Image was initially involved either. No, Joey. Joey got some because I I've got paperwork that has Joey's name on, but not Bobby. Okay. Not Bobby. I was blown away. I couldn't believe that. Yeah. You, what you don't like the guy and just gonna like not give him any they, credit? They keep, Jerry had Jerry always had a thing against Bobby, dude. He always did. It went back all the... All, so let all, me ask you, so do you think that that uh, justifies the fact oh that my he got... God, no. He Absolutely got, he not. Takes, takes the, the, the record label to, to court or, or sues them to get royalties for everybody else except Bobby Steele? What, what, what is... That's, that's not fair. That's just... Fair. That's favoritism. And that's why I, I, I didn't like his ethics. You know? Yeah. Like, has yeah, nothing. Yeah. It's like whatever he felt was right, he did it his way. Right. So, so at some point, he's just going like, "We we should right. get on this this misfits train." Right. And so, so suddenly, the closer we got to ninety five is when he started yeah. realizing, "I want to do the misfits again." And then once he got the law, the lawsuit settlement, it was in his right, according to the lawsuit settlement, that he was allowed to use the name and play the songs live. Uh, as a new misfits band however they yeah were, they were not allowed to record any old misfit songs so right. when evil. when yeah. when evil live 2 yeah. right which made no sense so they release evil live 2 and there's at least one or two songs that are old misfit songs on there right oh, i told i think it's I, a bunch of I told Glenn about that because Glenn and I had become friend, friends. We, we became acquaintances right. after my uh, involvement with the band. And I told him, I said, you do. It was you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's rewind. Hold on. Now we're going to rewind the tape again because I want to hear your, you were, I mean, you, you, did you go to Sam Hain shows or what was your, you were really into Sam Hain, right? Like, yeah. so what I, happened? You, you one found of first, out one of the first shows I ever saw was at Danceteria in New York City in 1985. Yes. Okay. There is a recording of that show. Oh no shit! Oh oh stop stop! You remember that that book we were talking about that Erie Vaughn book with um oh actually was I talking to you about that I, Erie I, Vaughn I, has got a book out of his I photography. Have I have the yeah. book Misery Misery Obscure. Do you know? Do you know in the book where there's a picture of a of a yellow looks like this a yellow line yeah. paper of a of a set list from that show i just mentioned that oh. is my song list that i sold on ebay back in 2000 wow it's, it's two pieces of yellow uh 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 what do they call that ledger, uh, ledger paper, ledger paper. Yeah. two pieces taped together and glenn wrote down all the songs for the sam Hain show after the show at danceteria i snagged it off the stage i had it for Oh my God, what, 20 some years? Wow. And I sold it. And then I'm looking through Erie's book and I see, I'm like, holy shit, that's my, that was a song list that I, I saved all these years. I had it in, in the Initium album sleeve. Yeah. Yeah. And I had it for years. And then I took it out, I sold it, and then I saw it in Erie's book. I almost dropped my pants. It was that's really hilarious. cool. Yeah. Um, that guy, Greg, who I was mentioning before, who's also been on my show, he recorded that Dance Interior show. So if you ever want to listen to it, just go on YouTube. It's there. Wow. If you ever want to take a trip down memory lane. So what happened? So you got into the Miss. So you first, did you explain to me how you first heard the Misfits? I think you did, right? Um, Didn't you? Well, it all sort of came with my era of being into punk rock. Right, okay. <clears throat> Right after, uh, right around the time I was a, a senior in high school. So I was around 17, 18 years old. Gotcha, gotcha, and gotcha. I, I just started getting into the mystery. It wasn't like a planned thing. Like, all, right. I, I considered them to be just another death rock band. 
And it wasn't until after, like maybe two years later, when I began to understand that they were limited edition uh, records. And then the right, thrash, right, right. the Thrasher magazine came out. 86, with the, right. With the interview of Glenn Danzig and yeah. all the records, how many were printed and right, right, so on right, and so right. forth, colored vinyls. That's when I became a collector. Um, when did, okay, I here's, this is a two punch question. When did, or no, no, just one question. Um, your, what did you love so much about Sam Hain? Was it just because it was Glenn Danzig's next band? And more so, I love asking this question to people who I think can really answer the question. I asked this to Damien from Sam Hain, actually. He gave me a very interesting answer. And I want to ask you, what, why is Sam Hain such a crazy, unique, what makes them so unique because. and like interesting? Because, and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget my conversations with Erie, how he told me, when they started Sam Hain, it was four guys, or at least three, I, I can't speak for Damien, all I can speak for is for Steve, Glenn, and right. uh, Erie. They lived the part, just like I lived the part when I joined the Misfits. I dressed like that all the time. I, I, I was... I was a living ghoul for the misfits, you know, but yeah. So when Erie told me we live like this, we are, we are real ghouls. You know, when we get in, uh, uh, like when we get up every day, we put our sweatpants on and our, and our gloves on and our black clothes and we dye yeah. our hair and that's how we look every day. And, and that's what they did. That's how they looked. And I appreciated that because that's what I was into. And by that point in time, I was in full black, you know, clothes with the engineer boots up to my knees and the leather jacket and the gloves in 90 degree heat. So that's, that's what turned me on to them is because they were real. And even like when you listen to the songs of Sam Hain, right. uh, it's, you know, it's all about the, the death rock, the horror yeah. And, and that's what I appreciated because I know that after they did uh, Earth AD as the Misfits, Jerry even told me he felt that Glenn was going in a satanic pathway. And I'm yeah. like, so what? Who cares? It's friggin' rock and roll. You know, the yeah. devil goes hand in hand with rock and roll. Right. Very true. But, but Jerry was doing bands like Christ the Conqueror. So that tells you where his perspective is. Right. Let's talk about Earth AD for a minute and something else that has always kind of like uh, boggled my mind. And you being a Sam Hain fan and an, an admirer of Earth AD, I'm very curious to hear what you think about this, this idea of like how like Earth AD, half of the songs on Earth AD were supposed to be Sam Hain songs. And, you know, could Earth AD songs, first of all, did, did Jerry? Did you ever ask Jerry questions about Earth AD? Like what? Like what went down and yada 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 and anything? I don't know any kind of details you remember from that. That's kind of interesting, actually. What? What? What are you? Uh, well, if since you're an Earth AD fan, I mean, I remember him telling me how they recorded it. Uh, they, yeah. they basically went into a studio in California and did a recording overnight. Um, yeah, and. Uh, I, I I told Jerry, like, when he asked me, like, what's your favorite record? I'm like, Earth AD. He's like, oh, I, I, I like American Psycho. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> Can I tell you? Um, so, you know, I, what can I tell you about that record? I, I don't know any specific details, but... Uh, Let me ask you this. How about this? Let me ask you this instead. So I've heard some difference in timelines. I've heard, the, the story goes that they did the last show and then they never spoke again. And then Glenn released earth AD after the band broke up. Is that how you understand it as well? They were, they had just cut off contacts from each other. Like it was, just I, over. I, I can't tell you exactly. I don't know exactly what went down after Glenn left. Um, but there was a lot of animosity. He, he, he told me from, from an interview I did with him, he basically told me he couldn't deal with Jerry's obsession to be in control all the time. Um, yeah. And you know, they're, 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 but the funny thing is, is, you know, Glenn's just as bad. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's a total control. control yeah. uh, and I've heard a lot of stories about him. 
yeah. you know, nothing nothing personal against him. He's that's just right. who he is. That's why he's gotten right. as far as he did. He did, and the same with Jerry for that matter. I mean, it, yeah. you know, he's got got a vision, and that, that's yeah. what's gotten him where he is. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, Glenn uh, just couldn't really work with him anymore, and that happens with fans. It, I guess they were together yeah. for what five, six years, maybe six, seven years, seven. And, seven years and uh you know it just didn't pan out it happens a lot you know a lot um and then what's interesting is yeah so so after your tours with the misfits you become a journalist and you're you're, you're doing this article for glenn and you're like hey did you know you're like, hey, did you know that I like sang for Jerry and Doyle and the Misfits? Like, right. what is okay. that? Like? Well, here's what happened. Okay, yeah, so, uh, I remember I was in the office at the aquarium, <laughs> and the uh, the editor at the time, Chris Yule, he says, yeah. hey, Mike, he goes, he goes, Mike, you do you want to interview Glenn Danzig? I said, sure, why not? <laughs> I said, but you got to talk to the publicist and make sure he knows that it was me who was with Jerry and the misfits. And I don't, I want to make sure that there's no animosity. Right. No problem. So had you met him before that point? Was that your first time meeting him? Oh, I met him a couple times prior, but not, okay. not like I did as a journalist. Gotcha. Uh, so the publicist contacts Jerry uh, Glenn and says to him, the person who's going to interview you is the former singer for the mistress. <laughs> so once Glenn found out who it was, me, he, he was cool with it. Cause I had nothing, I had nothing against Glenn. And I, at the time I had nothing against Michael either. Right. So, um, okay. So the day comes where I do the interview. I, I go to New York to this hotel. I forget where it was. And I, it's pouring rain out and I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the lobby waiting for Glenn to show up. And uh, he shows up with his, at the time, manager and a publicist. They walk through the door. It was pretty obvious I was there to see them. I'm wearing like a leather jacket. Yeah. You know, all black clothes, long black hair. Yeah. So um, I walk up and I'm like, hey, how you doing? I'm Mike here to here to interview you. So we get into the elevator. The, 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 the manager and the publicist leave. And Glenn and I get into the elevator. And I said to Glenn, I said, uh, I said, so I got to ask you, I said, what did you think when your publicist told me that I would be the one interviewing you, knowing that I was with Jerry and the Misfits prior in 1998? He said, that was your funeral, man. You dug your own grave with that. <laughs> <laughs> but we got along very good. He he actually helped me uh, in getting my book published. Um, really? I, yeah, because initially I actually went to him. I asked him, would you be interested in publishing my book? And uh, he said, uh, I don't really do novels. So he said, but, you know, if you go to this this company or that company, they should be able to do it to you. So and I used wow. to talk to him quite frequently about things. Um, I used to call him up, you know, at Verotic and ask him a few questions. I actually sent him uh, a, a cover that Spy Society did of horror business. We did this lounge version of of heart like a I've heard really, it. It's a great version. It's a great thank cover. You, thank I you. like and it. I like Glenn, it. When I told I told Glenn I, I'll send you a, a copy of it. I sent it to him when I called him up and asked him like, so how did you like that version of horror business? He said, Mike, that was one of the best versions of horror business I ever heard. <laughs> so, again, flabber, fl flattered that he would say that. In addition, one night I bumped into uh, Steve Zing. Yeah, I bumped into Steve Zing at a club, and I just walked up to him and I started talking to him. He goes, you know, it's funny you're here. He goes just a couple of days ago, Glenn and I were watching you sing when you did the misfit stuff. We were watching it on, on the internet and Glenn said you were the best they had. Wow. So that really went, my head just went. Wee. <laughs> That's interesting that Glenn is like, you know, I always wondered that is Glenn secretly watching or listening to American psycho and famous monsters out of like some sort of morbid curiosity. There's gotta be some, which... some curiosity. I'm sure he gets, yeah. you know, somebody might bring it to him and say, Hey, check this out. Hey, let's so, have a laugh or something like that. You know, yeah. like in his <laughs> mind. So, I mean, you know, I, a lot of people do that. Uh, um, take it for what it is. Um, yeah. But you know, I was so flattered 
when Steve yeah. t- told me that Glenn actually really appreciated my work because I mean, I, I gave it my all, you know, I, I yeah. had the, f- the few problems that I, uh, a lot of problems that I had on tour with having lost my vocals, my voice after nine shows in a row, you know, I wasn't used to singing 30 some songs in one hour. Why? Okay. Is that why it happened? Why did yeah. you just, you just weren't, you just, you're, so, yeah, go ahead. A- a- Empire Hideous broke up in, on February 15th, 1998. Mm-hmm. Three months later, actually a month, two months later, after I meet Jerry at a horror convention, Chiller Theater convention. Chiller, um, yeah. I, I meet Jerry. I tell him that I'm no longer in the band. They were having trouble with Michael. They had booked a tour for South America. And uh, I basically tell them, like, you know, you, you should have picked me to be your singer in the first place because I could have done this for you. Yeah. And uh, that resonated with Kenny. Kenny told Jerry, Kenny, Kenny is uh, Jerry's brother. Right. Uh, Kenny told Jerry, April, I get a phone call. Was it April? Yeah. No, no, no. May, May, I get a phone call from Jerry. And explain, explain, hold on. I'm sorry to cut you off. I apologize. Explain for the audience what, what, where, uh, Kenny's involvement at that time. Kenny was the manager and the mascot. Kenny would come out dressed as the Crimson Ghost Ghost. at the beginning of the show. And he also managed the band. Right. So right. when I saw them in April at the horror convention in New Jersey, yeah. I was talking to Kenny. Kenny tells me we're having a lot of trouble with our singer, Michael Graves. And, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't want to go on this tour to South America. And that's when I turned to Kenny. I said, well, I said, okay. that's, you, 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 that's because you, you picked the wrong guy. I said, you should have picked yeah. me. I said, I wanted to audition for the band. But when I called up and got Doyle on the phone, Doyle asked me, uh, how much can you bench? Like weights? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, none, because I don't lift weights. He's like, oh, well, you're going to have to, you know, pump some iron. I'm like, okay. And then he asks me, do you do any drugs? And I'm like, well, aside from the pot that I smoke with your brother? No. <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, all right, uh, can you sound like Tom Jones? <laughs> what? I said, are you going <laughs> to tell me that Glenn Danzig sounds like Tom Jones on Earth AD? No, I don't think so. But I said, look, I said, it, I wait, said, what? Whoa. wait, wait, what I was, that's what I was asked. What, how, how would that even, how would that even, what would I that sound like? It's not on you. <laughs> it's not unusual to be loved by hey, anyone. Do, 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 do. You like you have to Hey, so, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so, you know. I'm getting asked all these stupid questions. Like how much yeah. do you weigh? At the time I was 145 pounds, 150 pounds. He's like, oh, we're going to have to beef you up a bit. I'm like, yeah. Okay. I said, listen, if you want a singer, give me a call. But all this other shit is nonsense. I'll sing for the band, but I'm not doing all this, all this other shit. And that was it. So I never auditioned for the band, but I wanted to. And they had, right. I had known them for like 11 years at that point. Okay. So, so, Eventually, uh, uh, all right. So fast forward to 1998. I tell I tell Kenny they, in my opinion, I felt that they picked the wrong guy. Right. I think they, and this is just my opinion. I felt that they picked Michael Graves because he was only 18 years old, maybe 19, and they wanted to mold him into 100%. exactly what they wanted him to do. And let's face it, at 18, 19 years old, you're very impressionable to, to impressionable to a guy who's like in his 40s and is in a famous band and has money to like make it happen. So you 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 do what they tell you. So they picked Michael Graves over me. I'm like, okay, so that it is what it is. So at the convention I tell him you should have picked me. Kenny tells Jerry, Jerry calls me in, 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 in May, tells me, we want you. How would you like to go on tour to South America? I'm like, yeah, let's go. So, uh, I basically put everything I owned cause I was moving out of the house. I was living in with the, with the band. Yeah. I put everything I owned into storage. Jerry told me to learn 35, uh, 30 songs, 35 songs. I learned them because I didn't know any of the new songs at all. And as far as the old right. songs are concerned, I Half the time, I didn't know what the hell Glenn Danzig was singing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. So all I heard was, whoa! 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 
Yeah, you, oh man, yeah. when I had to learn the yeah. song Mommy, Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight? That was a oh tough my one. God. Man. Uh, wow. Anywho, so, you know, I had to learn these songs. I had to put everything I owned in storage. I had to quit yeah. my job. I had to teach a new person how to do my job at the job I was working at. I had to get, I had to drive to Connecticut for like an eight hour day to get my passport in one day. Oh, passport situation. In, in addition to driving up to Vernon to rehearse like a couple days during the week, you know, and this all happened in two weeks. And then before right. I knew it, I was on a plane going to Europe because they then they I was when I did the audition, Michael had called up and left a message on Kenny's answering machine. And he was pissed because when they found out when Chud told him that I was being auditioned, yeah, to do the tour in South America, yeah. Michael called up and quit over the phone. He's like, if you're gonna get Mike Hideous to sing. F you and go F yourself and F my kiddies and that's it. Have fun. I quit. Yeah. So that's when Jerry's like, you want to go to, he goes, you want to go to Europe too? I'm like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to pass that up, man. You know I mean? You, you, it, the opportunity is there. You're going to take it. And that's exactly right. what I did. The thing right. was I had, I had, look, when I did Empire Hideous, we didn't do a punk rock set of 30 songs. We did, you know, usually like between, 10 or 11 songs which filled up 45 minutes to an hour of music and after each song we stopped you know the misfits do like the ramones they stop a song one two three four and they go into the next one right and it's a non-stop it's show a of it's a two high, of the high velocity yeah. lyrics so it took a lot out of me i wasn't used to it and after like the fifth show i was like oh my god i'm, I'm starting to lose my voice i wasn't used to it uh in addition to not having sang since February with my last show at Empire Hideous. It was wow. a, a big thing. So the European tour, which was something like 38 shows out of 43 days or something like that. Yeah. You know, we did the first run. We did nine shows in a row and it, it really, it murdered me. Yeah. Uh, so I really had a, I had a take care of my voice and, and I, there's a couple of shows. If you, if you watch them, you can hear me cracking. And, and that's because I just wasn't used to it. But by the time the second tour came around in South America, I was a fucking rock. I was so, yeah, my body good. was so tight and I was in the yeah. best shape I had ever been in my life. And I knocked those lyrics out like a mf -er. Yeah. Yeah. Not, um, to, not to toot my own horn. But yeah. To toot but my what's, own horn. What, what's, what's interesting too. And then, I made a note of this because someone brought this up and you, you, you may or may not remember, by the way, I saw, I know we've been ignoring comments because I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the conversation and I'll get to them in a second. Um, but uh, it's my understanding of uh, a, a long, uh, of, of a listener of the show, commentator and listener who comes in here all the time, or I think he's here now, Pete, friend Pete. Um, he said to uh, ask Mike about something that Chud stole from you did Ch did chud steal things from you when you guys were on tour was he was he a was he a, a a thief and notice how i didn't say the things i just said things so if you just if if it's just things and you want to leave it at things you can leave All it right. at things but in, chud in, is in my book <laughs> in my book i wrote about a show yeah. that we did in <laughs> south america <clears throat> and uh as a joke, when we went to South America, the big joke was we were talking about bestiality pornography. <laughs> what? All right. Hey, so okay. now, I had never seen any sort of bestiality pornography. I'd never seen gotcha. it before in my life. Gotcha. Okay? Gotcha. And, and at the time, I was already like, you know, I think I was like 30 years old when I got the gig with the Misfits. So uh, maybe 32. So uh we were just, you know, there was this ongoing joke and tank John. Yeah. Um, he was busting my chops. He's like, I'm going to get you a video. You can watch it. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. So one day I think we were in Brazil Yeah. and I'm on the bus and tank walks in for those of you who don't know tank tank was working. He was, uh, he was one of the crew guys for uh, the misfits when, when I was in the band. So he walks in and he tosses, he tosses this videotape at me. <laughs> It was a bestiality film. Oh my god! <laughs> of women oh having sex god. with like horses oh and goats and god. monkeys. 
Oh and my I, God. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so yeah. on, on the bus, we had a, a, a VCR with a television. So as I'm standing there, look at, I'm, I'm holding the videotape. I'm like, I got like this. I'm, I'm holding the videotape and I'm looking right. at it. And Chud walks over and basically grabs it and pulls it right out of my hand. He's like, let me see that. And I'm like, oh, okay. I wasn't reading that or anything. So he, he, he takes it. He's like, oh, let's watch this. So he puts it in the VCR of on the bus. And a, I don't know. It just wouldn't play for some reason. He must have spent almost 45 minutes trying to get that fucking thing to work. Of course TV. he would. Like he was just amazed with it. <laughs> and then you know what he does after – after he couldn't get it to, to, to work, what took the tape out and put it in his bag. And I'm like, hey, where's my tape? And I'm like, Chud, you got my tape? He's like, no. I'm like, well, what's that in your bag? He's like, oh, like, like you forgot, you know, like you forgot a bestiality film. Oh, I must have put it in my bag. I didn't realize that. So that was the first thing. The other thing was uh, we did another show in uh, – I forget where it was in South America. And he asked, we use, I used to use a Walkman, a cassette Walkman to, to listen to a vocal warm up. Yeah. So that I could do warm ups before the show. Right. So Chud asked if he could borrow it. And he borrowed my, my, my little Walkman. And again, it ended up in his bag. I was like, okay, you're a kleptomaniac too. Kleptomaniac. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's a he's an interesting one. He's an interesting guy. Okay, I'm, I'm glad I made a note of that because I uh, I didn't know I honestly didn't know the story. I didn't know the story, so it was interesting to hear it. Let me just go. Hold on, we got a couple of comments here, real quick. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, the videographer, he says, "Don't see the comic stuff in the shop, but I think everyone here should buy it for Jeff so he could dramatically read it on the show." What I do is I part of my shtick on the show is. I analyze because this we're we're a misfits nerd show. Well, not this show, the other show we do. This is Pizza Punk. This is different. It happens to it happens to be intersectional because I'm I have someone who played in the misfits, so it, it crosses over in this episode. It's a crossover episode. But normally we look at old interviews and you know comment on stuff and yada yada yada. And that's what he's referring to that 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 sort of thing. Uh, so guys, listen, uh, uh, make Mike Cole here pitch in. If you pitch in and, and buy this this thing for whatever Mike's price is, I and you send me a copy of it, I will absolutely read it on here and and we'll have a, a good time. Maybe maybe uh, I'll ask Mike to join me and we could sit and uh, do a dramatic reading for you and we'll have a grand old time doing it. Uh, I would uh, be honored. Oh, that's awesome. Paul says, I've always wanted to see, I've always seen the Misfits as a network of people from band members to guys doing the shirts. The guys like Jeff put it. Oh, thanks, dude, for putting in the work to getting interviews to the fans. Rabbit and hardcore. Thanks for all the hard work, Mike and Jeff. Hey, thank you. Thanks for thanks for watching every week. Jerry released an album called The Devil's Reign. Very satanic. This is true. This is true. But that's the thing about Jerry, though. Jerry contradicts himself. Like, like whatever you want to, whatever the case may be. And this is not talking. It's listen, just the truth. When I was in the band, he kept saying for every time somebody asked him where he did an interview, he kept saying how he felt that the misfits were a positive influence on the youth. And I would say, but, I, and then I would say, so why are we doing a song called last caress where I raped your mother today and I killed your right, baby today? Right, right, how right, is right, that? right. You tell me how that is a positive influence. Now let me, right. let me be specific here. I'm an, I'm not a, an old fogey or a prude or something. Look, words don't bother me. I'm very, right. it's, it's very difficult to insult me with words, but don't, don't sit there and tell me, uh, you know, mommy, can I go out and kill tonight is an inspiration or, or an, in, uh, you know, positive influence for, for youth. Right. In addition, in addition, how could you go from in the, in the eighties from a, a band that had death as its logo, right. To joining a band called Christ, the conqueror, where Christ comes back with, you know, uh, a cross in one hand and a machine gun in the other. What the hell is that about? So it's like, uh, whatever. I, I, I can't really speak for the man. He's got his own version on things, whatever. I will say he looks great at his age uh, when he got oh my old, God. 
for when he got all set up for this whole this new misfits thing. God bless him. He looks fantastic. Yeah. God bless uh, you, Jerry. Or, or truly, actually for truly. What I would say, I would probably say, Lucifer, bless you, because I am a Satanist, and that's ah, not, there you go. Not something I would have to like contradict with Jerry, but if he believes in God and then he's so great. I, why why are you in a band that is so creepy and horror you know horror related where is the i, I fail to see the, the the connection to christian belief i really do well what's interesting it's funny you bring that up two things one first of all i just want to read peter's comment because i think it's such a nice comment he says i still have to find that picture that mike drew me at the dancing Dancing oh, show, the dancing show uh, in Philadelphia. Back I in remember Trump. who that is now. Okay. Yeah. I, I, hey, man, what's up? What's up, Peter? There you go. Yeah. Um, you're we, very we, popular we, on we, this we, show, Mike. We were standing outside of Glenn's bus after Danzig played. In fact, Sam Hain and Danzig played. And yeah. Peter came up to me and nice. Once he figured out who he, who I was, he asked me to draw him a picture. So I drew him this crazy zombie picture. <laughs> um. So what's interesting about what you just said about Jerry, we were just the episode we were doing last night. We were looking at an interview that Jerry did in 2013, where he's talking about how he stopped playing last caress, which would not last. Of course, he would start playing it again specifically because of the lyrics and his faith, which I find very interesting that you said that because like, he didn't they change the lyrics to, didn't they change the lyrics to it too? He, he said he used to sing. I fed a baby today, but then I might. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I got something to say. I fed yeah, a baby today. Go, baby. Yeah. Baby. <laughs> you know how Jerry does with the one bass line. He's like, oh, I got something to say. No, but you know what's interesting though? You know I fed your baby. <laughs> I fed your baby today. Yeah, but, but what I think is interesting. I'm sorry. Is that? Crazy. But how? But what about like skulls? You know, like skulls, right? Off little girls and put them on my wall. You know, right. like it's teenagers just, from Mars. Yeah, teenagers from Mars. You know, oh, it. The, <laughs> I mean, you know, you know what's the what's the lyric where they talk about uh, screwing little girls or inseminating little girls? Yeah, insemination. Yes, insemination. Yeah. Right. So, oh, uh, you know. It's a whole thing. It's all. It's all. It is a whole thing. People are Mommy, asking, "Can how... I go out and kill tonight?" Same thing. Right. It, 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 there's right. no. There's no connection to positive uh, reinforcement to youth from the lyrics and the songs of the old misfits, and that's where I think there's a lot of hypocrisy going on. Because I mean, come on, man. You want to be a religious person? Fine. Keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. You know, don't don't yeah. preach. You know, e even the song "Dig Up Her Bones." Well, we talked about this in our conversation. Mike and I spoke on the phone and I was telling him about, you know, how my realization that the Misfits 95 material is just like super, like subversively Christian, which again, unlike Mike, I don't have any problem with, with organized religion per se. And like, if that's their trip, whatever, but it's just, it just blew my mind that I'd been listening to those songs for a long time, you know, just always, you know, I'd heard those songs. But I'd never ever noticed that you know what he, what exactly they are all singing about, and it just kind of I don't know, man. It, it's it's pretty we it, it's pretty weird. Mm -hmm. So you saw you saw some weird shit on that on those Misfits tours, though. Like it was like a crazy weird like I'll put it to you this way. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. After about the th second or third week of being on tour in Europe, I began to realize things weren't exactly as I thought they would be. Okay. And I'd be like, we began to play these big festivals where I was meet. I met bands like no effects, Primus, hmm. uh, uh, Pantera, uh, 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 what the hell is that band? Um, Deftones. In fact, uh, uh, Chino, the singer from Deftones, was really cool to me. Took me around, like introduced oh. me to people. Because, like I told him, like I'm the new singer. He's like, oh, come with me. I'll, I'll introduce you to people. And I met all these bands, Cold Chamber, all these bands, and I began to see the unity for all these other bands. And yet, when I would go on that tour bus, and they had a band meeting, I wasn't allowed to be in the room in 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 the lobby of the bus 
while they had that meeting. What's they, the band? Me hold on. Explain what band meeting. What they were I'll having. Tell you what the band meetings were. The band meetings were to say we don't like Mike Hideous. We want Michael Graves back. Oh, that, that oh, was what it was all about. Band meetings. Gotcha. The, the reason they became they became nervous because I was having a problem losing my voice. Now, not for nothing, but I'm. The Misfits vocals are not all that impressionable. Don't no disrespect to Glenn. But they're not Tom Jones. They're not uh, uh, Frank Sinatra or Tony Bennett. They're punk rock. So, you know, getting on yeah. stage and not being able to sing be or, or having problems singing because I was losing my voice, I don't think it made that much of a terrible uh, impact. I went out there. I still gave it my all. I, I jumped around on that stage. Mm -hmm. I interacted with the audience. I would jump into the audience sometimes. I mean, I did things I had never done with the Miss, uh, with the Empire Hideous, with my band, but I did it because I knew I had to be a showman in this band. This was a big band for me. We were playing nothing less than, uh, you know, three to 500 at, at, a, at a club. In festivals, the most we played to was about 12,000. So, I, I I knew I had to be Mike Hideous and come out and be a showman, even if my vocals weren't top notch. But again, by the time I hit South America, I was hitting all the notes and I was doing a good job. The problem was, excuse me, Chud and and Doyle, they didn't want me in the band. They were loyal. They were loyal to Michael Graves. Right. Right. And, and yeah. the funny thing is, here's Jerry, who is the the proprietor of the band, the guy who's running the band. Right. Who who gets me in, patting me on the back, calling me his little brother. He's like, come here, giving me noogies on my head. And and just like so like we were so bonded. Like he really had a respect for me because I was. Do and he would say, if, if I saw Michael Gray's right now, I'd punch him right in the face. Hmm. And, I, and I began to ask him, am I am I? Here's what happened. My girlfriend, she had seen on MTV News, the Misfits are auditioning a new singer in Europe. Now, I wasn't told that I was being auditioned. I was told that mm. I was the lead singer for the band and that I was going to sign a contract thus. And then my girlfriend, I talked to her. In, I was in Germany and I called home. She's like, you know, I just saw something on uh, MTV the other day and it says that they're auditioning you. Did you know that? And I said, no. So I approached Jerry and Kenny and I said, what's going on? Well, and then it comes out. Then the truth comes out. Well, we thought you, we would audition you. This would be an audition tour and we'll see how it goes. That's funny. Nobody told me that because you were yeah. hell bent on having me sign a contract before I got into the band. So that you didn't deal with the same project, uh, same problem that you dealt with with Glenn and Michael. So weren't now weren't you writing songs too? At some point, weren't you you you're writing material that was meant to be Misfits material? Yes, because when on the on the flight home from South America, Jerry said to me, "Start writing lyrics because when we get back, we're going to start recording for a new record." Hmm. So I began writing all these new songs. One was called "An Eye for an Eye." Another one wow. saw, Another song was called "Killing You." Uh, what else? Uh, wow, I never I knew that. Those songs ended up becoming the songs for Spy Society 99, SS 99. Oh, now you know what's interesting, and we were talking about this. I had Loki and I had JV Bastard, Joe, Joe Vasta, right? Who's also a Mr. Monster, had them both on the show, and by the way. I, guys, I am sorry to tell everybody this, and I should have said something at the beginning. I have, so I use two StreamYard accounts, right, to do the show. Mike, I was telling you about this. Um, my 20 hours is going to be up at two hours and 40 minutes. So right now, we have 22 minutes left, and I don't know what happens at 22 minutes. I don't know if it'll let us continue. I don't know if it'll automatically stop. I'm just letting everybody know right now that we are down to our last 22 minutes Unfortunately, I'm honestly shocked that we're still talking. It's two hours and 18 minutes we've been going. It's been a, a wonderful time. So let's well run. Let's run out the clock. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Right. Um, I just wanted to put that out there so everybody who's watching and Mike can just let let y'all guys know what the situation yeah, is. Well, when we get to the three hour mark, well, I'll just say goodbye and and <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll end it. I don't want you to. Get Hopefully, cut I off, hope man. we get. I hope I hope we get there. Um, but I let me ask you this. Cut off though. 
I hope so. I hope not. I really hope not. I have no idea. I've never made it to the full 20. Usually when I get to this point, I switch over to the other account. In any case, I don't want to waste any time. When I I was with talking with Loki, we were talking live on the air. We, as a matter of fact, someone was mentioning Jerry Only's new tattoo. Jerry Only has actually, I love Jerry Only's new tattoo. It's a picture of Jesus with a devil lock. I swear to God and not to Jesus, God, to God. <laughs> Jerry has a devil lock, Jesus, but it, dude, you know what, Mike? You <laughs> said you so, don't like. That's no. blasphemous. <laughs> Dude, it's awesome. And you want to know something, Mike? Even you, who doesn't like organized religion, oh. you friggin' love this tattoo. Because it's just it? like, I don't, oh man, someone get me a picture of the tattoo. I don't. I don't <laughs> off the top of my head. But it's who, a fun, we, we were mean, looking at it. Who it's awesome, that? dude. Who does that? And he's, dude, he has the, he has the under eye makeup and stuff. And it's oh. something about, no, it's awesome. Something about Jesus. the blood of, of, of God or something. I love oh, it. I yeah, thought it was yeah. great. In any case. In any case, what we were started to talk about is what would the Misfits 95 had sounded like if you had gotten the audition and not Mike. And I talked to this, talked with you a little bit about this. Would it have been, it would have been more like darker and, and, you know, goth, gothic. Like what, what do you think it would have been more like? Well, I could tell you right now, I probably wouldn't have had much say if, at all any uh in 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 how i did things because uh you know jerry is a control freak um but i think the difference between uh myself and Graves was that i and i could be wrong <clears throat> i think Graves had a, a bit more he was more of a tenor yeah and i think in in a lot of songs i i i was able to hit a lot more lower notes i was more right tenor, tenor baritone maybe mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. uh, i try i tried to reach as many uh uh you know levels as i could in dynamic yeah right my dynamics and my range yeah um but you know i mean when when i've heard michael sing uh it was just a little yeah yeah <laughs> he will escape. i was doing this last night so i'm doing it one more time <laughs> listen guys i actually like some of michael graves songs i just want to put that out there I'm ragging on Michael, but you know what? I like about a, a bunch of American Psycho, but I am still going to go. This <laughs> point me to the sky. All right, I'm sorry. Go ahead. C continue. I'm sorry <laughs> to interrupt you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Just I'm poking fun. I'm, go, yeah. ahead. go ahead. Anywho. Uh, no, I just feel that he he was a uh, he was a different singer than I was. That's right, all. Uh, right. And 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 again, the fact that I lost my 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 voice after nine shows in a row was simply because I was not ready for that. I I had never done anything like that before, and I even tried to explain to Jerry. Look, and I used like the only terms I could use, which were weightlifting. I said, "Listen, like a weightlifter." Yeah, you, you've got to build your stamina. Keep in mind, I've never done nine punk rock shows in a row where I sang for a full hour. I mean, he told and you two weeks before it, the tour, right? Like, right. I in, mean, in addition, I I could not sleep on a moving vehicle. Every time we, yeah. got bus, we had these bunks, I I never slept. I was like a mess and, and jet lag and, and jet, jet lag. lag. I was yeah. a mess. I, I could see that, I was, man. I'm so tired. So I said to him, listen, if you give me the opportunity to build up my vocals, I guarantee you I will be the best singer you ever had. Uh -huh. And they just weren't prepared for that. They wanted, like I said, they yeah. wanted Tom Jones. So, you know, go get fucking Tom Jones for all I care. Yeah. Oh, my God. Tom Jones. You just blew my mind. Tom Jones doing like, like Earth Day. Wasp. Day. Wasp. Yeah, wasp or how about day day monomania? Day monomania, I'm the beast. Day monomania, day monomania, day monomania. Ho ho ho! Yeah, yeah. Hey, see you in Vegas. Um, hold on, we got some comments here. <laughs> it's it's hilarious. Um, hold on one second. Big Mike is the man. Big hello from Tijuana, Mexico, from the Mech Wolf. Oh, Peter says. Ask Mike about Doyle's trash bag water balloons. He, <laughs> he, he threw out of hotel rooms. Oh, my What's Lord. The... That, was, that was crazy. <laughs> All right. So we're in this hotel room in, 
I don't know, maybe Brazil, somewhere in South America. And he's telling me this story about how he took a, a garbage bag filled it up with water and dropped it off at like a 40 story building or a 30 story building. I was, and it makes this huge kaboom when it hits the ground. And he's telling me how he did it. So, and mind you, this is after a show and like every, like it's late at night. Eventually he goes to his room and I go to, I go to bed. In fact, I don't even go to bed. I'm still sitting here with this guy, Dylan, who used to do yeah. the, uh, uh, or Ian who used to do the, the, um, the, the, the soundboard. And we're sitting in the room. We're watching like the the Spanish version of the Discovery Channel. Yeah, you know, and like you can see like the lion attacking the zebra, and as he's attacking, he roars in Spanish. So um, <laughs> that was a joke. Um, yeah. So anyway, sorry, I missed there. the joke. <laughs> Went over my head. Sorry. Uh, Go know, ahead. A lion attacking in Spanish. Get it? So yeah, anyhow, so we're sitting there, and it's like I don't know, two, three o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden we hear. Boom! Outside. I'm like, what the hell was that? So I go and I look out. Now, mind you, Doyle's room was right above us. Right. So I go and I look out the window because, like, the window was one of those windows that opens up like that. Right. So I look out and all I could see was this garbage bag on the ground and this gigantic puddle of water. <laughs> he's hey, lucky he didn't. Gotta have he's fun lucky didn't. Wow. He's got to blow. He didn't kill somebody. Got to blow off steam somehow. Now, speaking of killing somebody, I remember, I don't know if it was in a movie I saw once or if it was, I, I remember seeing, there was some video footage where didn't, do, uh, once again, not the El Kabong incident, but with that happened in the early Misfits, but like, weren't you, you guys were in South America and somebody ran on the stage and got like thrown into the, pit and almost like cracked their head open or something or probably did, didn't someone probably. get i don't know someone got roughed up or something probably. um i've seen it. i saw doyle stomp on someone's head in, in, in during a show wow. i was just i was amazed he didn't crush this guy's head he literally like full force lifted up his knee and boom right on the guy's head i'm like oh my god this there's guy's some there's a video of of youtube video of you're in some club and you're going like this. You're like, come on, motherfucker. Like you, because it's almost like a bait and we, switch. I think we were either in France or, or Germany. And some yeah. guy, every, let me tell you, every single show I played, yeah. there was some asshole in the audience egging me on because I was either not Glenn Danzig or not Michael Graves. <laughs> and Michael had the same problem when he was in the band. Right. It's a, right. You know, and then I, I say to myself, what the hell did you spend $40 to get in this concert for? If you're going to start a fight and get thrown out, you idiot. So right. every, every single show we played, somebody was either throwing something at me or, or, or provoking me to come into the audience. So right. the, the footage that you're talking about, I think it was either Germany or it probably was Germany and the stage was low. Yes. So the, the audience was yes. like, you know, like they were about up to my, my, my chest. So there's one guy in the audience and he's like throwing shit at me and he's giving me the finger and he's going, come on out here. Come on. Out. And I'm like, why I'm doing a show. I, what do you, yeah. what am I going to, I'm going to stop the show and come down and fight you yet moron. So, uh, while that's happening, Doyle, Doyle loves to fight. Doyle sees this happening <laughs> and Doyle gets between me and this guy as I'm trying to get him to come closer so I can punch him. Uh, and Doyle's just getting in and he's waiting, like Doyle's playing guitar and he's waiting for him to bring his hand up so he can grab his right. hand. He, he wants to break his knuckles because yeah. like I said, Doyle's a monster. He's, I mean, this yeah. guy's got muscles in his head. He's so big. Yeah. Um, yes. so yeah, just do not F with Doyle. I could tell you that he is. I'll never monster. forget. I'll never forget. I went backstage at Riot Fest Chicago right after the original Misfits played. I just literally just met Jerry for the first time and I see Doyle. And Doyle's busy, and I don't want to bother him. I just walk by him, and I say, thank you for that amazing show. And I reach out, I shake his hand, and I'll never forget the feeling of this dude's giant, giant hand. hand, like my little hand in his giant hand, and just thinking like how he could just crush all the bones in my hand if he wanted to. <laughs> he's he really is. He's, just a, he's br and, the brute and, strength. And again, the guy looks, he, he's another one, looks fantastic for his age. You know, yeah. kudos to him and Jerry. They yeah. look fantastic. Good for them. Which, by the way, so so again, without without getting into uh, all sorts of other jazz. Now, 
what was very interesting to me, the first time that you and I were in a room together, you don't know. I remember because I knew who you were. You didn't know who I was. We were, it was Chiller Theater, 2011. That was when I met Sal B. And I met a bunch of people that day. And you got, it was crazy. It was like all these guys, you guys were all in the same room together. It was oh, not that was like Bobby Steele, Erie yeah, Vaughn, uh, friggin' uh, Doyle, uh, Chud was there, Graves was there. Uh, they put all the misfit guys in the same room, and and Sal B yeah, was I, walking around. I didn't, I didn't ask for that, by the way. I, I was put right. there because uh, Kevin, right, 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 right. It was, it was, uh, it was a, a situation that was sort of, but it, it was amazing because I don't think any of you guys were ever in the same room like that again. That was like a sort of like a a last time. Uh, Excuse uh, me, one deal. second. Go ahead. Everything okay? Yeah, my cat was crying. I was wondering if they were fighting or not. Sorry. Oh, no. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's all right. It's all right. It, no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I don't know if it was, I don't know if, if it was at that venue or maybe it was a little bit later, but that's when I came over to your apartment and we did that interview, your, your right. studio for the yeah. first time. That's where right. Mike and I uh, converged about uh, about 10 years ago. And you could see Mike, Mike, he had this lifelike skeleton and he sat next to it on a couch and we did this interview that no one still, I have, I have honestly not watched it in 10 years. So I'm very excited. Like I know that we, we didn't talk about new misfits. So I'm very excited to see what was discussed. I probably some of the stuff that we discussed here and uh, I can't wait to, uh, to, you know, look, look it over and, and whatnot. You know, it's going to be very, going to be interesting. I, I, I remember that night. Yeah, that was, that was a, that was a fun interview. Um, and uh yeah, I, I'm I'm really looking forward to the day when you put that out. I, I think it was eventually. Yeah. So maybe when the maybe I hope the rapture doesn't happen anytime soon, Mike, because yeah. I'll I'll turn to all the I'll go I'll turn to all the what is it? I don't even know how well the rapture works. I'm not I'm not Christian myself, but you know, <laughs> like you know, I'll turn to all the angels and go, hold on, I'm still working on this edit. Let me finish <laughs> what I'm doing. Let and, me and just you can also say, hey, look, don't worry about me. Go get the guy who's got the tattoo, the blasphemous tattoo of Jesus. Dude, it's an <laughs> awesome tattoo. It's an awesome... Let me tell you something. If I ever if I ever cross paths with Jerry only again, the first thing I'm gonna go up to him, I'm gonna say, I freaking love your tattoo. It's badass, freaking <laughs> awesome. Jesus awesome is tattoo. a death rocker. Yeah, dude. For real. I mean, he kind of is. You know, I will say this. Listen, we've been talking we've been talking a lot about like the the ups and downs of things, but I will say this and I said this to Mike over the phone as well. The thing about Jerry is if you're a fan of Jerry's like, you know, you're going to get the best side of Jerry. And I've seen that side of Jerry and it's a very nice side of Jerry. It, it all depends on, you know, the the so situation you are, and what you're Right, done. but but you know, the other thing I would say too in Mike in your situation you were on tour with these guys. I've talked about this before, not in relation to the Misfits, but just in touring. When you're with somebody 24 hours a day, you see everything. Right. You see the whole kit and kaboom. I, I, you probably I, saw I, I got to see Jerry's pants after he played a show. <laughs> I used to hang them right in front of my bunk. So I got to smell his balls all night. And you probably you probably got to see Chud be a chud and do all oh. sorts of debaucherous things and you probably saw you know doyle eat a chicken cutlet and I you probably him. at that show that we were just talking about where doyle and i almost had that incident with the guy in the audience yeah that very show yeah the, the band that went on before us he took yeah. a girl under the the drum riser and was screwing around with her i've heard this and had to stay there until they finished playing <laughs> He I've heard, I've heard that, I've heard that was something that he did on, kind of like on the regular, which on was like, regular. A, he used to like a, a thing that he was into. Well, yeah, you know. And I'll tell you, some of the women, oh my God, so right, right. I've heard, I've heard these things as well. Just, just <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous. And then what else is very interesting too is, I guess what's what is fascinating is that all you guys were under the same roof. You, you were there when. Michael Graves opened up for Danzig, which is kind of crazy no, in the sense that no, I no, wasn't. you weren't. You were not there. I, I was there. I was there to interview Glenn. Right. Okay. And, 
I, okay. I was there to interview. I thought you we were saw the show. Well, here, here's what happened. We went there yeah. specifically to interview Glenn for a film that we were doing at the time. Right, right, right. And um, as time went by, they ended up kicking us out of the club because we didn't have any VIP. And I kept asking, I'm like, you know, can uh, somebody at least give us a plastic so we can get in here? Couldn't happen. So they ended up kicking the, me and, 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 and the crew out. Yeah. And uh, we didn't see it. And frankly, I don't care because, you know, yeah, it really wasn't know. my beef anyway. From a from a from a nerd from a from a nerd perspective though, obsessing over like this band and stuff, that stuff is uh, it's just interesting how like those those things overlap. Hold on, we have a comment here. Go back to TSOL. There was a vid of this guy. I think he was drunk saying how the lead singer for TSOL should sing for the Misfits. I, are you talking about Jack Grisham? Um, that would be a very interesting choice. He's a very, I like Jack a lot. He's a phenomenal vocalist and singer. And uh, it would be kind of interesting to see how he, how he would sing for the Misfits. It would, uh, have you ever listened to Beneath the Shadows, that, uh, the, the follow-up LP to, to TSOL? Oh, gee, uh, I don't recall the title. I only have two records by them. The first one, and then I got yeah. a CD that was released in the 90s uh i i don't know disappear really don't. probably it probably was disappear i don't know I, I really don't know uh so i don't yeah. i couldn't tell you about the 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 song i'm not sure in any case that would be a very very interesting choice let me ask you this mike what do you think do you think that they'll keep going as long as the money as long as people keep paying as long as the guarantees yes. keep coming they'll look, never stop look jeff I disassociated myself with the Misfits a long time ago. I, I, yeah. I'm over the whole thing. I don't care about it anymore. As I said, I sold my 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 collection. As far as I see it, I was the Misfit singer for five months, uh -huh. and I I did my my very best to be the best that I possibly could. Um, and now I'm over it. I, I'm sick of the rumors. I'm sick of the hearsay. Yeah. I'm sick of all. You know, talk, 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 talk. I don't care. I really don't care anymore. So I, I just disassociated myself. And now that they're doing this, this major, major uh, reunion where they're, you know, making good money and good, good luck to them. I'm, I'm, I'm happy yeah. for them. They deserve. We are it. happy for them. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't care. I'm not involved in it anymore. Yeah. You know, I, I was happy being, uh, you know, an artist, just working on my paintings and my photography. Um, and occasionally writing a book or two or, or something, you know, but how does that, um, how does that happen with the painting? Do you just, do you sit down and go in your head? Like, do you, do you come at it with a feeling? Do you go, I'm going to paint a picture of this and it's just going to be painted. Like, how does that all work for you? Well, if you, if you go onto my Facebook page, I just uh -huh. recently released a, a, a video that I edited of, yeah. uh, it's a 10 minute short film of me uh, from the beginning of, a, of an idea with a drawing, which mm -hmm. becomes a canvas painting right up to the end. Um, I started it initially, I started it last de uh, December 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I began painting in the beginning of January of 2020. Uh, I put it away in April because I needed some time to get away from it. And then I just started again in January 1st, uh, 2021, and I finished it on March 12th. So I, I created this whole piece and I, I put the video up on my Facebook page, which I'll give you at the end of the show. And so I, I'm looking I'm, it up right now. I think I have it. Hold on. Let me see. Keep talking. Keep talking. Almost and so basically to answer your question, there's really no right way or wrong way to start a piece. Yeah. That's that's one of them. That's that's actually a drawing, but there's a painting that's even before that that post. But mm. uh, yeah, this basically shows how I start. Uh, I, I'm I'm working on a, on a big giant graphite piece that I made. Wow. And do you when you do that? Do you just like you just get lost in the drawing, like you're listening to music and, and just stuff in that particular drawing. Yes. As, as a matter of fact, just about every one of my paintings or drawings starts with a basic general idea. And then I work around it. As you can see, all this stuff is all morphed together. Um, yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's the finished product. 
Wait, that's the old. That's the place in Kearney, right? That's, that's the, the place old. In Kearney. That's right. Yeah, this is where this is Mike's old spot, and I'm really glad I pulled up this video because I just want to show everybody that you'll you'll he had and he had a table. Mike had a table that was like covered in like wax or vinyl two. or two. Yeah. What? Tell me about those. What were those tables again? Uh, refresh uh, I, my just, I just basically took some tables um, and I adhesed things to them uh it, it, one of them i had i had taken records and i melted them over the side and i put concert tickets and old uh uh driver's license and photographs from when i was a boy and little yeah. nick and i just i put i attached them to this table and then i coated the whole thing with shellac like 20 right that's shellac. what it is it was right. shellac it another was shellac. one i did Another one, I took all the money. When I was on tour at the Misfits, I collected all the change that people were, I was getting from whatever I bought. Yeah. So I kept money from every country that I was in. And then I yeah. took this table and I put all that money in a circle around the table along with all the Zima caps from all the Zima bottles I was drinking. <laughs> Zima. <laughs> um, somebody just said this. This is blowing my mind. Bobby Steele was invited to join TSOL in the mid eighties and he declined so we could focus on the undead. I have to ask Bobby about this. Wow. Wow. I was That's unaware. Crazy. Okay. Listen, we hit the two minute, uh, the two hour, 40 minute mark and we're still here. I guess, I guess it didn't, uh, it didn't knock us out. Should we do a little Q and a, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, round this off at a nice three hours. Okay, guys, we're going to do a little Q and a here. So if anybody wants to ask any questions, this is so cool. I thought it was going to knock us off. We're still going. It shouldn't. I mean, it, it shouldn't do it. I, I mean, mean it tells me I have 20 as hours. As you come to your three hours and, and just sort of wind down as you get to the third hour and then end the show, I don't think you should get knocked off. I, well, let's do that. That's what we're going to do. We're going to round it. You cool with you cool ending at three hours? Let's do it. Let's go. All right. So if anybody wants to ask any questions, Edgy Chan says, dang. Felt like listening to Mike Misfits live recordings, uh, and here he is in the live stream. This is sick. Perfect. Um, part two. Somebody wants a part two. I'll tell you what, Mike. The next time I have a good show where you're a good fit, like I'll fi I'll think of something. I don't know. We'll we'll have you we'll have you on again. We'll we'll sure, figure out something. To. Yeah. Cool. Cool. To. I don't I don't do many interviews anymore, but with people I know, and I know you, Jeff. So. Cool. I appreciate that, man. I think we'd have a good time. You know, we did a, I try, I had Loki on and you know what we did? We were going to try and do Dr. Loki, like, like doc, like love line, you know, like giving <laughs> advice, like bad <laughs> advice and nobody called into the show. So oh eventually God. then uh, Joe Vasta came in and then this guy, Howie Wowie from this band Nimvind. And then we had Robbie Bloodshed and pretty soon we were just shoot, we were just shooting the shit and we had, it was just like hanging out. Oh, Oni is asking, was Mike a fan of Killing Joke? Oh, my God. I love Killing Joke. I love them. Um, the best album was their first record, uh, Requiem. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, even songs like uh, in the uh, 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 80s, um, Love Like Blood. What a great, great song. I mean... I'm surprised that I never really listed Killing Joke more so as an influence of me because I absolutely love them. I really do. They are a fantastic band. Really, you know, band. I've never, I've never, ever, no, 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 no reason why I wouldn't, but I've never dived into Killing Joke. What is a good place to start? Give me the, what, what's a good first, record? The first record. The first record is called just called Killing Joke. It's a black and white cover. It looks like huh. a war, look like, like a war scene, um, and it's my favorite record of all time. Uh, but they have a couple wow. other ones. And in fact, as I said, the song '80s, which was a huge hit, and then the song "Love Like Blood." Wonderful, wonderful songs. Just I love that band. Love them. Love them. Um, Austin Smith is asking any chance Mike will ever release his handmade black magic book. Mm. Here's the thing about my black magic grimoire. I, I have studied, I have been studying the occult uh, demonology, Satanism, witchcraft, witchcraft pre 1960s uh, since 
2006. Really got into it. I read. I was reading like four books at a time. It was crazy, mm-hmm. and I got so interested in in some of the ancient history about grim wars and, and magic and so on and so forth. Uh, I decided to write my own grim war. So a friend of mine who had just come back from Turkey bought me a handmade leather bound book. Wow! And, and um, as a matter of fact, it's a. Uh, did I post that? It might be posted on my Facebook page. If not, it's on my YouTube page, uh, which is a uh, Mike Zone. Anyway, uh, so I got this book handmade, and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a a, a grim war, and basically a grim war for those of you who don't know is is a, a book of magical spells and rituals. And uh, I took all the knowledge that I had from all the books that I had been reading, and I. Here's why I won't release it, because I basically took a lot of information from other books. Now, I, I do give credit for them in the book, right? but I'll probably never publish it because it was more of a personal thing. That book took me exactly one year from day one to the wow. last day. One full year. I worked on it every single did you, day. Did you time I, that out or it just happened that way? Just just happened that way. Every wow. single day, for one year. I wrote more than 400 plus pages by hand. It has drawings that are both originals and copies from other books. And it's all contained in this one book. I'm very proud of it. That's awesome. That's really Thank one you. of a kind. I won't be releasing it though, because I think it's probably uh what would they call that? An infringement on copyright or something? Yeah. Copyright infringement, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but, what but is but Dr. There, there, there is a, there is a video that I put out of the book if you go to my my YouTube page, which I believe is Mike Zone, yeah, M M Y K E Z O N E, uh, you can see one of the uh, the videos is is of of the Grim War itself. What is Doctor Pud in the haunted houses, Paul? Please explain that. Unless Mike, do you know what that is? Doctor Pud in the haunted houses. No idea. Okay. Um, what is your favorite Kiss album? Plus, are you a fan of any Psychobilly? The recent Mentor single is pretty good. Kiss, my favorite Kiss record, Rock and Roll Over. Okay, okay. What, what, you know what, what was the other question? What was the other question? The other question is, uh, are you a fan of Rockabilly and the Meteors, uh, Meteors' recent single? I'm not familiar with the Meteors' recent single, but I, yes, I do have several Rockabilly uh, albums, Psychabilly, Rockabilly, Gothabilly. Uh, huh. I, I, I dig it. In fact, uh, Spy Society was kind of teetering on Gothabilly when we did it, which is again a, a, another CD band that I did, which is also available uh, at my website, mikehideous.com. There you go. And guys, those those websites are in the description, so please check out Mike's stuff. He's selling stuff. You know, support Mike and 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 his and his stuff. Peter Peter his says, stuff. "What's Mike's favorite?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter says, uh, "What is Mike's favorite horror movie of all time?" Oh, good question. Good question. There's a couple of them at the top. One of them is Roman Polanski's The Fearless Vampire Killers. Absolutely. Oh, you like good it? Movie, right? man. Yeah, Great I know that movie. movie. It's yeah. dark. It's got beautiful uh, architecture in it and scenery. Yeah, yeah, the sets and it's are so gothic. It's so gothic. But yeah, it's dude. a dark, dark comedy. And I love yes. it. Um, another yes. great movie would probably be Hellraiser. Um, I like Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Uh, of course, uh, a Bride of Frankenstein is one of my all-time favorites. Great. Uh, and in fact, probably out of the, the many Frankenstein movies that were made, I think there were five. Um, Bride of Frankenstein was probably voted voted uh, uh, called one of the best at 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 that time when it was made. It truly is. In fact, I think it's better than the first Frankenstein film uh, hmm. from the original. I've heard that. I've heard people say that. I think Did you so. ever try? I, tell me. Did you ever try talking like Universal Monsters with Jerry and Doyle? Like, you know, try and like, you know, just sort of, you know, be like, I don't know, connect with them in that kind of way because those guys are into that stuff? No. Uh, Joe S., interesting. Hey, Jeff and Mike. Yes, TSOL asked Bobby. All right, this is blowing my mind because I'm a ginormous TSOL fan. And like, I never miss an East Coast TSOL show ever. 
Uh, he says, yes, Tio Sowell asked Bobby to join when he was briefly living in California back in 1983. As said, he declined to focus on the undead, who at the time had Olga de Volga and Robo. That's right. Robo from Black Flag and the Misfits was also in the undead briefly. He um, did? Yes. Robo was in I the didn't... undead. I had no idea. Which, which leads to the question, because, you know, I've always stated that I don't think Bobby – could have held it down with Earth AD stuff. I love you, Bobby. Happy birthday. It's Bobby's birthday today. Happy birthday, oh, Bobby. That's, that's right. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> speaking of Bobby, um, I, I think that that music would not, even though Bobby was involved with like the beginning of hardcore, I just don't think he would have done, I don't know. It just it just goes against his 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 style of chops. Um, but it's interesting that he had Robo in the band. So could you imagine Robo and Bobby covering Earth AD stuff would be very interesting to say oh, the least. Kind of, yeah. Um, Austin Smith asks, Mike, any good stories from interviewing Ozzy and The Cure? There is, but we only have about three minutes left of the show. We, so, we have 11 uh, minutes. We have 11 oh, we minutes yeah, if you if you oh, think okay. you can do it in eleven minutes, yeah, yeah, yeah I could do it. Um, All right, go ahead. Go I'll, ahead. I'll make it quick. Ozzy, sure. Ozzy. When I got the 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 job to to interview Ozzy, uh, everybody at the office was telling me, "Oh, you're you're not going to understand a word he says." I'm like, "Get out of here!" That's a, okay. So, yeah. um, uh, so I go to the studio. Uh, I go to Sony Studios in New York. And I'm standing at the elevator getting ready to go upstairs to interview Ozzy Osbourne. And as I'm standing there, Ozzy Osbourne comes walking down the hallway with his publicist and one of his kids. And I'm like, oh, oh shit. So he comes up to me. We get in the elevator. And I'm like, hi, how you doing? I'm actually here to interview you. And he says, <laughs> and I stood there and I was like, uh okay and i i was so when when um, i couldn't understand a word he was saying and when when that happened i i kind of froze up and when we got to the floor he walked out and i just stood there like <laughs> and i kept going up and that was my floor i was supposed to get up on. i was completely <laughs> confused anyway that aside um the the only other thing of the cure the cure interview i ended up interviewing yeah. the whole band wow and at the time, we, we did the interview in the lobby of the hotel that they were staying at, and they were doing uh -huh. the the night I did the interview. Jane's Addiction was playing for the first time in I don't know how long, and they were doing a show at um, the Hammerstein Hammerstein Ballroom. Yeah, Hammerstein Ballroom. And they asked me, they're like, "Are you going to see Jane's Addiction tonight?" I'm like, "No, we couldn't get tickets. It sold out in six minutes." Wow. So. He said to me, well, Roger, the uh, guitar player, I think the guitar player, the keyboardist, I can't remember, said yeah. to me, don't worry, you come with us, we'll get you in. Nice. Like, okay. So he says to me, meet us at Hammerstein Ballroom in the front, and when we show up, we'll get you in. So I go to the Hammerstein Ballroom, I walk up to Will Call, yeah. and I said to him, hi, uh, I'm with The Cure, we're here to see the show. She's like, oh, that lady goes, oh, wait, wait, she goes security so i got like these four security guards <laughs> standing around me they thought i was in the in the cure <laughs> wow so eventually the band shows up we walk upstairs to the balcony and there yeah. i am sitting in the balcony watching jane's addiction play i'm sitting with the cure yes watching jane's addiction i i mean the the only thing that could have made my night is after we were done I get into a cab and then like, there's David Bowie going, hey, come on in, mate. We're going to take a ride. <laughs> but that didn't happen. That's, that's phenomenal. I have to tell you, and I want to tell you an Aussie story, super quick Aussie story. It's not even an Aussie story. It's more of me telling someone who interviewed Aussie, what he should have done in the situation. Uh, this guy, Greg, he interviews Aussie. He worked for faces magazine, he interviews Aussie. Um, Ozzy is crazy at this point in his life. It's sometime in the eighties. It's like a crazy Ozzy time. Right. He sits down and he goes, he goes, uh, they're talking about the new album and he's like, Oh, you want to hear the new album? Do you, you know, like something like that. And, and he goes here, he gives him the tape to put in his tape recorder. Right. Like, and, but the thing is, 
it's just a tape recorder. There's no, he can't, there's no headphones. So he tells Ozzy, I can't listen to your tape because, because the, 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 I can't, there's no way of listening to it with the headphones. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing here. I might be butchering the story. It's not my story. I want to emphasize that. Ozzy flipped the shit, just went, just went bananas, like berserk on him because he couldn't listen to his tape. And what I said to him was, dude, why didn't you just put the tape in the thing and pretend like you were listening to it? And he would have never <laughs> noticed. You could have just put it in the tape and just gone, yeah, Ozzy, it's really great. And Ozzy was like, oh, yeah, terrific. Hey, Roy. <laughs> Sharon! Sharon! Uh, Mike, what is, okay. Uh, we, you know, Joe, we answered all these questions, buddy. He says, Mike, what is your history with Christ the Conqueror? Were you ever involved, approached, auditioned? We answered all these questions yeah. hours ago. Listen to the <laughs> beginning of the show, buddy. You got to listen to the beginning of the show. We went through the whole thing. You can listen back. This guy's this will live on. Um, I want to thank Mike so much for coming on the show. I didn't think it was going to go this long. It's been wonderful. If you're new to the channel, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, especially subscribe. Subscriptions really, really help me and boost up the algorithm. Support this channel any which way you can. Um, and support Mike in any which way you can. Like I said, he's got his websites down there. He's got his new band going on. I really hope you guys get a chance to okay. uh, go out there and cut a rug. You know, the one thing we didn't talk about, and we started the we started our, our show talking about it. Let's end the show talking about it. What does the new band sound like? Like, what does the music sound like? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah. We have difficult answering, but... The song that we're releasing, to me, sounds very typo negative ish. Um, Interesting. However, however, that is not the direction we're going. As a matter of fact, uh, guitarist uh, Tony and I have been discussing the possibilities of tr trying not to go so heavy metal, and maybe oh. give it a little bit more of an edge where um, you might even hear it in a dance. Uh, you know, in a club, like, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard to, we're, we're still working no, it I, out, Jeff. We're still working it out. We haven't quite found a solid direction yet. So it's still sort of in the sounds middle. interesting. Sounds yeah. interesting. I like, you know, it's funny how, you know, and I, you know, dance can mean a lot of different things, but like when, when you say the word dance, what I imagine in my head is like something with, you know, either keys or synth or I don't know, something that might make it more, give it more of a dance vibe. And I can kind of, uh, it sounds like maybe, are you guys kind of going in a little bit of a post-punk direction? A little bit? Like, it's it's hard to say because, again, it's very new. We just, you know, I'm just starting to put lyrics together to some of the songs that were, which were already written by Tony. So yeah. the next step is we're going to write things together. And it's... um. It's it's really in its early early stages. So gotcha. since we're not going to be touring this year, we're going to be spending time trying to release a record. Russell, I'll talk to you after the show, buddy. I'm so sorry we skipped your question. We'll we'll find it. We'll, we'll Russell. I'll I'll talk to you after the show. Um, possibilities of new sound, Spy Society ninety nine. Asked Joe. Pro probably not. I have a few songs that I had written that never made it to to the, the the CD that was released. When the CD was released, I actually recorded three new songs, which I had actually recorded for another project I was doing with Empire Hideous. And I kind of converted them into Spy Society songs. But I still have about five other songs from Spy Society that I never released and I never recorded. So wow. as much as I'd love to do them, I just don't have the capability. I'm not tech savvy. I have no idea how to work like pro tools or any of that shit. And I'm not a, I'm not a good musician. I just play basic stuff, you know, but uh, gotcha. I'd like to, but I doubt it'll happen. I'm retired for crying out loud. I, every time I retire, they pull me, pull back, me in. back in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those Italian roots, they come through, they come through. We, well, that was the thing when Mike was telling me, he was like, oh, well, Jeff, I'm going to save it for the show. But, and I was like, just when they pull you out, they pull you back in, whatever, from, uh, from, uh, from Godfather. Godfather. Yeah. Um, is there anything, Mike, we're about to hit our three-hour mark. We're going to say our final goodbyes. Is there anything else 
that we didn't talk about that you would like to promote? I just um, want to do my promotions and that's it. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So if, if you're interested, folks, if you're interested in any of the music or the, uh, the T-shirts uh, or the tons of merchandise I've got, um, everything from like throw pillows uh, with Frankenstein on it to throw blankets with bats on them and so on and so on, mykideous.com, M-Y-K-E, hideous.com. In the uh, description. Also has, you know, plenty of my, uh, my music. You can either download it or buy CDs. Also, if you're interested in any of my artwork or photography or, or prints or anything like that, you can go to my website, which is spy man, photo and art.com spy man, photo and art.com. And last but not least, if you want to contact me directly, you can reach me on Facebook at facebook.com slash hideous. Mike M Y K E. Thank you very much, Jeff. I had a great time. Thank you everyone oh, for, for writing in and asking questions. I had a wonderful time. I would love to do it again sometime. Okay. We'll fit. Listen, we'll figure it out. Next time we do a round table thing, we'll, we'll have you on and we'll, we'll all bullshit. It's a really good time. It's, it's a lot of fun. We're about to have our, our, hold on. We're about to hit the 30 seconds. I I'm OCD about this. It has to be exactly on the nose. So just stick around. We're we're counting down. Guys, thank you so much for such a great show. Stick, Thanks, guys. guys, keep your eyes peeled for my Screaming Jay Hawkins video coming. I'm doing a oh. Screaming Jay Hawkins video. It's going to be very info informational. It's not like a live stream. Like, it's going to be like a, a, a edited thing. And here it goes. Peace and hair grease.